Hello, I'm Andrew Sullivan, President and CEO of the Internet Society, and this is my report to the Board of Trustees at the 2021 Annual General Meeting on our Action Plan 2021 Success Measures pro uh, progress. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started uh, work on improving the way that we report on our activities. Uh, and there are two different ways that we do that. One is success measures where we report on the extent to which we are achieving the things that we set out for ourselves in a project or in an, in an initiative. Uh, the other is, uh, is impact indicators, which have to do with uh, whether we change the world, whether we make an effect on it. Uh, that comes in an annual report that we um, put out every year. This, uh, the, the one for 2020 was put out a, a little while ago. Uh, this update is really about success measures the measures that the projects um, are doing. And I really, really appreciate the work of my um, colleagues in planning and reporting who prepared this report for us. You'll remember that we have three broad areas of work uh, at the Internet Society. We have two kinds of projects. Uh, we have um, uh, projects that work on making the internet grow, and we have other projects that work on ensuring the strength of the internet. And then we have initiatives which are really about our community and things that we're doing within the organization. These are all things that we're going to um, talk about today. So first of all, we'll talk about the projects to do with growing the internet. Uh, the first of these is building community networks. Community networks are efforts uh, for alternative kind of kinds of connectivity in places that are generally not well served by traditional uh, connectivity answers. And so we have a number of these uh, success measures. Um, and as you can see, we're making uh, some progress on all of them. So the first one was a, a goal of 10 new and existing community networks deployed, uh, either through our direct engagement or through our partners. Uh, the aim of those was 10. And so far, we've managed to do um, seven. So we believe that we're pretty much on track in order to achieve this in 2021. Similarly, we wanted to work on countries because uh, generally speaking, one of the barriers to a lot of community networks has to do with um, spectrum regulation and so far, so far. Um, we have so far managed to make uh, um, changes in four of the countries that we were intending, uh, three of them in the last quarter. Um, the, um, the total for the year is uh, we're aiming at is, is five. So we believe that we're in good shape um, for this. Uh, we also have a lot of work um, to do with training the community to make sure that the community actually can uh, can achieve these things. Obviously, you can't have a community network without an effective community. Uh, so we are aiming at 300 individuals trained. We're just a little under um, uh, half of them. There are more trainings planned for uh, Q3 and Q4. So we believe that this will um, be successful this year. Uh, so far, we have not um, uh, uh, talked about um, the leaders. We have not done that work yet. That is all scheduled for the second half of the year. Uh, finally, we have this um, uh, work that we're doing with new partners. So it's generally the case that the Internet Society cannot work on its own. Uh, instead, we need to work through partners and um, uh, other organizations, um, various um, groups of people who work with us. Uh, we um, signed a uh, new partnership with UNESCO in, um, in the second quarter of this year. And so far this year, we have managed to um, work with four of the five on um, target for the year. So we believe that this is on track for the year as well. The next project is um, the project Fostering Infrastructure and Community Development. This has really two components. One is infrastructure, particularly internet exchange points, but not only that. Uh, and the second part is the community around those internet exchange points. It's no use having a big internet exchange point if you don't have a group of people uh, there to, to operate it. And so we, we work on both things at the same time. Uh, so the first of these was uh, working on new and existing um, internet exchange points. Uh, we want to make sure that um, these are in, in good shape. So the aim was to get five new IXPs um, in, in the course of the year and to work with 15 existing ones in the course of the year. Um, uh, so far this year, we've managed to start um, with three new IXPs uh, and we believe that there are a couple more um, that are coming within the year. So we anticipate that we will achieve this goal. Um, we, we have worked with eight of the, um, of the IXPs that we were already working with um, and we continue to, um, uh, to work with new ones. Uh, we think that this is going to um, going to be successful, but we uh, still have some work to do to um, uh, to uh, 
connect with some of the IXPs that uh, that are out there that that you know maybe can use our help. Um, this is a little bit more difficult um, due to the ongoing pandemic restrictions, and so that is one of the things that is possibly a um, a, a drag on this. But at the moment, we believe that we're on on track for this. Uh, we also entered into a number of partnerships, and we um, we track that as well. Uh, our goal was to either continue or to start. Um, uh, five um, five partnerships. Uh, we've already achieved um, eight this year, so this is um, a, a goal that is well and truly in hand. Uh, we wanted to work on the number of um, people taking the, the, the NetOps training. Um, we had an original target of 500 people. This has been enormously successful. Um, the um, uh, the the training and e-learning um, part of the organization is, as you know. Uh, ramped up, ramping up this year. Um, there's um, new work going on uh, within that, and a new um, a new learning management system that just went live. Uh, so we've had more than uh, twice as many people have taken the um, this course as um, as we aimed for. So it's really been a very very successful um, uh, successful effort so far. Uh, and what this means, of course, is that we're we're going to be able to continue to expand that um, the that outreach and that outreach develops the communities who can build the internet themselves in their locations. Uh, finally, we have um, on this slide, we have this number of countries that are engaged to support IXPs through their policies. And this is actually an important thing. A lot of countries um, are, are suspicious of, of internet exchange points or they uh, want to control them. They, they don't want them to be neutral. And we, we're working with countries in order to make sure that the policies do not discourage this kind of development because it is really, really good for local access to have uh, internet exchanges within, uh, within various geographic um, and political uh, boundaries. So um, we've, we aimed to work with five, uh, five such countries. So far, we've managed to um, uh, work with four this year. Um, there was one uh, engagement um, that is notable with the government of Kuwait. So uh, we find that um, uh, we're, we're having um, positive effects um, within the government uh, realm as well. The last uh, project in this uh, in this area is measuring the internet. This is our measurement plat um, platform, which used to be called um, Insights, but uh, we've rebranded that as Pulse. Um, so that's still uh, on here, um, noted as the um, as one of the activities that I'm, uh, that we undertook this year. Uh, version two of this platform is is targeted for this year. So the the, the platform initially launched only a year ago. Um, we um, you know, we knew that it was a sort of an early version. Uh, we're going to have version two of it. Um, that is on track. On track. Uh, we were working uh, away, but of course, we haven't actually delivered um, the new the new code yet. Uh, we need. We're not actually doing the measuring, and this is an important part of this project. That what this really is is a sort of clearinghouse of existing uh, measurement sources that are that are in the world. And so we're trying to, um, to work with, um, with others and we, we need partnerships in order to do that. The goal for this year was three, we've got two of them so far. Um, so we're, we're, we're working uh, away. We believe we're gonna have another um, data source in, in Q3 and if that happens, then we'll, uh, we'll hit this um, target easily. Uh, we've got two new focus areas intended um, uh, intended for the year. Um, we worked on it in in this year, but we haven't actually done any of this. We haven't launched these um, yet. So so far that is at zero, but um, that's because the the release of them is is slated for later in the year. The next uh, area for projects is strengthening the internet. And the first of these is promoting the internet way of networking. It, it's important to remember that there are lots of ways to build networks. You can build a network in a very centralized way. You can build a, a network in a, in a way built, built on treaties, just as the telephone system um, worked. But the internet way of networking is to use the open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet and connect things using the voluntary measures that are, are the hallmark of the way that the internet is built. And so that's what this is about. We, we promote this way of networking because we believe that this delivers the best value uh, for everybody in the world. It, it has given us all of the marvels that the internet has brought to us. Um, and so we continue to, um, to, to promote this. We're, we're engaged with external entities um, that includes chapters 
who produce additional use cases with this framework. So we have a framework, we released it, um, and we're, we're continuing to refine it. Um, but that framework um, was released last year, and we're continuing to um, push people to do this. We aimed to have five external entities um, working with this framework and, and using it and developing it themselves. So far, we've had two, um, but we have had um, uh, we've had some success, particularly with two chapters who have picked this up and really worked hard with it. We also have a training course uh, that we continue uh, continue to push, and uh, we were aiming to train 200 people on this on this framework. It's a you know it's a it's a sort of specialist um, topic, so it's not a huge number of people, um, but it's also a very small community. And uh, so we were aiming for 200. We've so far managed to train 169 people uh, on this. This was the um, uh, this was the enrollment. We haven't had a completion rate um, because that feature is missing. Um, uh, we will have it in the future, so we don't exactly know how many people have completed the course. But we've had 169 enrollments so far. Another project has to do with extending encryption. Encryption, of course, is really important to the internet because without encryption, you can't have certain kinds of security. And this is uh, security against tampering with, uh, with flows of data. It's also security of the data within it. And so we're working very hard uh, with a lot of partners to extend encryption and to get people to understand what an advantage and boon encryption is to everybody on the internet. The first uh, target that we had was to grow the Global Encryption Coalition membership. We um, uh, set this, uh, this uh, coalition up with some other partners last year, and we've had uh, quite a lot of success. Um, the target for the year was to add 200 new members. Uh, we're already, uh, we've already added 180 people. Um, uh, the Internet Society, uh, Latin American and Caribbean chapters have mostly joined. It's, um, it's a steady pace e each quarter. Um, so we, we are confident that this is a goal that can be, um, can be met. We've also done some uh, training of people on encryption and advocacy, and we've already exceeded our target for the year uh, on this. We anticipate that there will probably be some more. Um, this is uh, really a, a fundamentals um, kind of issue, and this is really the, uh, the goal that we have. Um, finally, we've got this uh, extension of the reach. We want to, to reach a lot of people with this message. Uh, so we're aiming to reach a million people on this year. And so far, we've only reached 4,500. So this, is, um, this will seem like a low number. We believe, however, that we're still on track to achieve this because uh, we have um, a global encryption day that is coming in, in October. And we anticipate that that will be the, you know, where most of the, of the audience comes from. So we're still optimistic about this and believe that we will achieve it. The next project is securing global routing. Uh, the, this is related to the Manners uh, project. Uh, Manners is intended to be uh, an independent organization that uh, allows uh, in interested parties to gather together in order to ensure mutually accepted norms for routing security. And so we have a number of success measures for this. Uh, the first is an increase in route origin authorization uh, creation by the existing manners for participants. So we want participants to, to increase their use of, of ROAs. Uh, ROAs are the mechanism by which you indicate that uh, somebody is authorized to originate routes for your IP range. Uh, the idea here was to increase this by 10%. Uh, we've already got um, a better than that, so we've achieved this. Uh, the other part of, uh, of, of route origin um, authorization, the other part that you need, of course, is validation of, of those things. And so what we want to do is make sure that existing managed participants um, start to do this. And our target for this year was about 5%. Um, this is, we think it's on, pro, uh, it, it's on track, but we, we don't know exactly um, uh, whether this is going to be possible because it's hard to measure. So we're working on the measurement. We think we've got uh, a plan. We believe it's on track, but we don't have anything that's actually operating yet. Uh, we're um, we're also hoping to uh, to see greater conformance improvement from uh, from before people join the managed pro, um, uh, project. So. Uh, the early days of Manners, a lot of the people who joined were actually very, very well operated networks. They, um, you know, they generally didn't have problems and so on, and uh, and people were were, you know, keen not to join if they if they weren't not uh, up to snuff. Some of the people we're attracting now are are less capable on uh, or have been less capable, and uh, what we're doing is, uh, you know, through the community making. Uh, you know, making improvements in their networks. And so what we see 
are people who, you know, three months before they join, um, they're at one level, and then we um, evaluate three months after and see what their conformance improvement is. And we've got about 30% here. Uh, so far um, in Q2, we had about 37% uh, in row use. So uh, this seems to be uh, our, you know, a real improvement. Um, there have only been two Bogon incidents uh, among members in, in, in Q2, so that was really good. In Q1, there were none. So uh, on the whole, I think this is, uh, this is achieved and we hope to continue um, this pace. Finally, as I mentioned, um, this is supposed to become a community operated, um, uh, operated service. It's something that the community desires to do independently. Uh, and so uh, the, the question is, is the community ready to do that? And uh, we want to make sure that they're ready. This year, we've completed a community consultation on this. We've also got a charter um, ready to go. So we believe that, in fact, um, the community is ready to do this. We still have to work out some details of, uh, of the organizational structure, whether this is going to be a disregarded entity inside the Internet Society or whether it will be an independent nonprofit or, or so forth. Uh, so that's still, to be, uh, that's still a detail to be worked out, but on the whole, we believe that this is on track. We also have a number of, of activities that are not exactly projects in that they don't, they don't have an end, right? We, the, the goal of projects is really to have a beginning and then you do some work and you measure that in the middle. And then when you're finished um, with that, when you've met all your goals, the project is, is completed and then you can move on to another project. Other kinds of activities that the Internet Society does are not really like that. They are initiatives, they get things started, and then you know that activity continues and continues to operate. Or there are simple operational things that we have to do uh, that ensure that our community is lively and in good shape. And that's what the rest of these are about. So the first of these has to do with supporting community um, uh, participation. And the first of those uh, is the engagement of individual members. So we're, we're trying to improve the individual member, um, uh, the individual member experience at the Internet Society. Um, so what we wanted to do was increase it. Uh, we know um, we know that the um, we, we got, have to start with a baseline. So this is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, so far, what we've got is this baseline of 5,000. We want to increase the number of individual members participating in our activities. And we're, our, our aim here is 5,000 uh, individual members. So far this year, uh, we've had uh, 3,214. So uh, we believe that we're on, tr on track to, um, uh, to achieve this because, of course, that's, that's more than half. Uh, of our goal. Um, if we can achieve this baseline, then we'll be able to build uh, in the future. We've also been working on improving the uh, fundamental information we provide to our chapters. Uh, so we want to make sure, for instance, that chapter members are trained in our mission. Um, for 2021, we had a, uh, a plan of, of 500 um, chapter members uh, who, would, who would participate in this. We've had 526 unique participants um, in, in these trainings. So, you know, we have achieved this. What is not clear is how many, in, how many different chapters were involved. So, of course, multiple people from the same chapter all count in this, in this total. And uh, we're pretty sure that it's, it's a wide variety of chapters, but uh, we're, we're actually currently working on that. So I don't have that answer for you right now. Uh, we also want chapters to implement an activity and we want that activity to be related to the mission. So the goal here is to say, okay, how many of the participating chapters that were involved in this, um, how many of them were uh, then created an activity locally that was in line with, um, with the training? Um, so the deadline for submission of these activities was extended. It was extended at the beginning of the month. So um, we haven't updated this because I don't have the answers yet, but we believe this is on track. We've had very, very good response from chapters. So we believe that this is on track. We've also tackled the issue of special interest groups at the Internet Society. This has been a longstanding problem, um, the way that um, the special interest groups, they were originally structured as sort of similar to chapters, but because they're not in a place, they didn't have bank accounts, it was all very complicated. So we're trying to, trying to fix that. Um, and so we have this plan to have a new structure in place by the end of 2021 and then ready to operate um, in, in 2022. This is... Um, Ongoing, we believe that it's in progress. We believe we, we will be ready by the um, by the end of the year. Uh, in order to in order to make this new plan work, uh, we need topics, particular topics that are going to be identified by the community. The plan is basically that the community will will have five special interest um, groups that it picks um, uh, 
every two years. And so that's the, that's the, the way that this is going to work. So we've got to identify those topics. And so we need to identify those topics for 2022. We need to do that now in order to, in order to be ready to run in, um, uh, in, in 2022. And uh, we're working on it. It appears that um, uh, things are in good shape. Uh, we've had a lot of topics um, submitted. So we want to get five. We had 123 submissions. So um, this is going to involve quite a bit of work uh, in order to, to pare this down. Um, the, the goal has been to keep the number manageable because um, you know it, it's, it's a lot of work to manage a whole lot of these things. The way this is going to end up working is that instead of the special interest group having to operate independently the way chapters do, they will be folded inside the internet society and there'll be an internet society activity, very much the way the IETF used to work. Um, so um, it, for, for that reason, we wanna keep the numbers relatively small because we don't have a huge staff that um, can look after this. Uh, 123 is definitely too many. Uh, it might be that five is too few and we might have to, um, we might have to accept that. Um, I would like it to stay around five because I don't think that much more than that is really manageable, but um, given the community response, it's pretty clear that there's a wide variety of things that people want to do. Uh, so we believe that this is going to be selected. We'll get um, we'll get this buttoned up by the end of the year. Uh, we also want to um, have a growth in the ISOC members who participate in this consultation. So um, it, it's really important, actually, that you know this not be a tiny group of people who all have the who are all talking to each other. What we really want is is this to be a, a vibrant part of the internet society community and to make sure that individual members really take, the, um, take advantage of this be benefit of membership. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we've got a baseline number um, that we set in, in 2021, and then we can make that grow um, in the future. So obviously the, the consultation is going to close. It, it has closed, in fact, it's, it closed on the 12th of July. Um, so we'll know what that number is by the end of the year and we will have this baseline. We also want to uh, strengthen community connections. So we want to improve our software. Um, some of our software has been problematic for the community and we recognize that. And so what we're trying to do is, um, is, is fix this. Uh, we, we had a, a big consultation that we've been trying to, uh, trying to work on in order to improve this software. We wanted to talk to people. We wanted uh, you know 80% of our community to be consulted on this. Um, there have been very wide consultations with chapters, with org members and um, individual members that have been contacted. We think we're going to get to 80%. Um, this, isn't, uh, this is scheduled to be completed by the end of the month, so we don't actually know yet whether we're done uh, and whether we achieve that, but we'll, we'll know what the number is um, you know, before, the middle, um, before the end of the year for sure. Uh, we want to select the vendor this year. We want to do it by the 31st of August, so that's a tight timeline because the Consultations finish in July. We want to we want to select um, some vendors based on the criteria by the end of August. So that's really the plan. Um, the whole thing we want to get going. Um, uh, we want to have a complete implementation plan schedule uh, ready by the thirty first of October, and that will mean, of course, that then that will give us the planning necessary in order to do the implementation next year. So this is not, of course, started because. Um, we, we really need to work on the vendor selection first in order to, in, in order to start this. We've been working very hard on content to improve our content um, this year. Content has been um, uh, traditionally a, a little bit of a problem at the Internet Society. We have too much content on too many topics. It's very difficult to find things. And so what we're trying to do is, is whittle this down in a way so that the audience can be satisfied, they can understand this, and, and they can say, oh, yes, this is, this is good. So the big target um, uh, here is measuring the content, the, the audience satisfaction. So that's really the, the big first problem. We have to understand what the audience is, what they want, and how satisfied they are. Um, we're about 40% of the way through this, um, and then we will have a picture of what the audience satisfaction rate is. And then, of course, we can tell whether it gets better. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is, is really make sure that the things that are on our website are really strategically aligned with our strategic objectives and with our content strategy. So the goal is to make sure that 50% of our web content is actually related to the things we say we're working on. 
Um, there are reasons why um, content might not be aligned. Uh, for instance, it might be aligned to something that we had in the past. It might be, um, it might be you know, things that are just um, legal requirements, for instance, so our 990s, that's part of our content on our website. They're never gonna be strategically aligned with us in the sense that you know, they're, they're a report. Um, uh, but what we want is 50% of our, of our content is really about our topic. Uh, and so far, um, the analysis of this is, is, is we're through it 40%. So we looked at 40% of the content um, to do the evaluation of this. That's, um, that's where we are in the progress. We think that this will be done by the end of the year. Uh, what this is going to involve is a fairly aggressive archiving strategy afterwards. Uh, and this will mean that, you know, we will put in um, uh, tombstones and so on for content, not that is removed, but we'll, we'll put in redirections so that it goes into the archive on site instead. And that way we can keep the live website active on, on the, the current things and we can put uh, archives uh, off to the side of, of content that is, you know, not necessarily uh, up to date, maybe not relevant today, uh, maybe not the things that, um, that people are, are looking for. Uh, this will improve um, the experience of users on the site because they will be able to find the information that they're looking for and they will be able to um, be connected to the activities that we're currently working on. We also need to build the expertise and capacity of the organization in order to do all of this support. And so that's the, um, this category of measure. Uh, we've been trying to make sure that we have good training uh, for the community. And you will recall that uh, last year uh, in the budget request, well, those of you who are here will recall that um, we, we had this um, fairly large um, uh, board designated fund for training and e-learning activities. Uh, that is what we're uh, delivering on right now. And that's what this is um, all, of, uh, all about measuring. So we've had, um, we aimed to have 30 online learning activities uh, this year. We've managed to do 33 already. So, um, uh, and we, we do all of these in all three of our supported languages. Uh, so this means that we're doing a lot of um, a lot of work um, uh, to make sure um, that this is happening. In in the first quarter of the year, we only offered courses in English, so we've we've had to undertake a lot of translation. So that lowered um, demand in the first quarter, but we we find that we've actually had a lot of uptake on this. We want to reach ten thousand people um, with our training this year, and so far uh, we've reached three thousand five hundred and eleven. Um, but the number of courses is expanding. And also we have the new um, platform that we have just launched. So there were some courses that were not developed uh, and were not released into the old platform because we didn't wanna put effort into a platform we knew we were, uh, we knew we were shutting down. So the new platform has, uh, has launched. It is much more dynamic. It, is, uh, it, it has better measurement um, techniques in it. So we will be able to offer even more courses. So we believe we're on track with this even though that isn't, um, you know, we're, we're halfway through the year and we're not 50% um, of the way there. We wanted 90% of the people who took these things and who rated the course, we wanted 90% of them to, um, to give, you know, to have a high value. Uh, what we've had instead is 95% rate, uh, uh, rating. So we've had overall course satisfaction. This is only in the Q1 courses. Um, all of the data hasn't been tabulated for Q2 yet. Um, we also wanted some partners to help on our uh, on our revenue generation. So the goal with the um, with the learning activities is that it become a self supporting uh, activity, uh, that it becomes self sustaining. And that does not mean, of course, that everybody who takes a course has to pay us for it. There are lots of ways um, uh, to make things um, sustaining, and one of those is sponsorship. And so we needed some partners who would help us with that. Uh, our goal was to get two partners who would um, who would help us with that. And we have, in fact, managed to sign up uh, to two partners, including the Organization of American States, um, who, uh, who just uh, who signed up um, in this quarter. So we believe that we're on track uh, in, in this. Uh, not all of the agreements have been signed, but we believe that we're we're going to get there. We also want to prepare future Internet advocates. So in the past, we had a fellowship program that um, some of you will remember we thought didn't actually have clear measurable goals what what were these fellows doing and so we decided to redesign the fellowship program and we um we broke it into two parts one for early career people and another one for mid-career people the early career fellowship um uh, uh activity 
was to be launched this year. That was achieved in the first quarter. And we wanted to uh, make sure, of course, that we got a baseline uh, established for the number in, in each. So we established um, that we're gonna uh, have 164 candidates. We got 164 candidates. And so this is in progress um, because the fellowship is now running. We also wanted the, um, the, the plan for the mid-career fellowship uh, to, be, to be built. So we're not launching this fellowship this year. We just wanted the plan uh, to be developed. That has happened. Uh, so um, this, is, this is now um, you know, rolling ahead. And then finally, again, we need partners to help us um, uh, support this because this is an expensive activity and uh, we can't pay for it all ourselves. So we need to make sure that we've got partners uh, who are involved. The other reason, of course, we want partners to be involved is because if you have partners involved in a project, uh, then you are sure that you know, this is an activity that is valuable to, to those other people. So we don't do it all ourselves. We're not off in some echo chamber. And our goal was to secure four partners for that, but we've already got five signed up. We've also had four, four sponsors. Uh, who are helping us to pay for it, but are not um, are not actually participating in the activity, uh, and that's a, also a very good sign because what that means is that people think what we're doing is valuable. We're trying to foster inform information exchange among researchers, and this is a, a goal that we share with the foundation. The foundation, of course, does this um, by uh, by direct um, funding of um, of researchers. What we try to do is ensure that the collaboration space is available. And we do this primarily through the Network and Distributed System Security Symposium or NDSS. This year it had to go online. Um, uh, and, uh, but our goal was to make sure that we continued uh, to have NDSS ranked in the top five. That ranking hasn't been announced yet, so we don't know, um, but we're, uh, we're cautiously optimistic um, because we had a very successful program this year. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we have a collaboration between the research community and the open standards community. So one of the reasons that we want to participate in this is, of course, not just because it's a nice activity, it is a good activity on its own, but research without uh, effect is, is perhaps less valuable. So we're trying to make sure that there is a collaboration between people who are, who are researchers and the people who are building the open standards. This year, we wanted to aim for one of those, one such collaboration. We haven't achieved it yet, but we believe that we probably will. We need to, in order to do all of this, we have to secure resources. The organization needs to have money and people, a community of, uh, of engaged people uh, to help us uh, to help us do that. And that's what this is about. Our first big issue, of course, is um, diverse revenue sources. This is a long-standing issue. The Internet Society gets a lot of money from one source. And that is not really a healthy thing for the organization. So we want to make sure that we don't have that kind of problem. Um, so what we're trying to do, first of all, is have um, uh, active memoranda of understanding with partners, engage them with um, various projects and so on. This makes sure that the projects are viable and that they are, um, are you know, diverse in, in, in how they are funded. Uh, we wanted to aim for 50 such uh, memoranda of understanding. We've got 38 so far. Uh, so we've you know, we think we're going to be in pretty, pretty good shape. We've got some, uh, some new partners, both in Q1 and Q2. So we believe that this is um, probably um, active. We've been looking for new sources of funding um, and, and, and securing those sources of funding. We wanted to make sure that we got 10 new sources of funding. Uh, we've so far managed to get eight. So I believe that this, um, this is really on track. The revenue target that we have for this is a five hundred thousand dollars. So we want half a million dollars um, uh, in, in uh, from these uh, sources of revenue. So far, uh, we have managed to raise one hundred and thirty nine thousand eight hundred dollars. So we're not really halfway there. Nevertheless, we believe that some of the activities that are coming in the latter half of the year are probably sort of places where we're going to find a lot of um, a, a lot of support. So we think that this is on track, but um, I recognize that. You know, if you look at that that target number and the uh, and the progress number, and you look at the calendar, you think, well, this isn't really on track. Uh, I believe it is, but that's mostly because some of the activities that are coming later in the year are really some of the opportunities that will allow us to get closer to this goal. So I hope that this gives you a pretty good picture of what's going on within the Internet Society. That you have an idea 
of, of how the activities are and how we're meeting our, our targets for the year. Uh, we will update you again when the year is over um, because that way you will know um, how we're doing on these things. Thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions that trustees may have at the meeting. Hello, everyone. I'm Rinalia Abdurrahim, Senior Vice President for Strategy, Communications and Engagement at ISOC. This is a presentation for the ISOC Board of Trustees about the findings from our consultation with the ISOC community regarding priorities for the 2022 Action Plan. Every year, as part of our planning process to produce the Internet Society Action Plan, staff would carry out a consultation with members of the ISOC community. The intention is to gather feedback about priorities for the upcoming year. The priorities are determined by the senior executive team, and they are based on our longer term 2025 strategic objectives that focus on building, promoting and defending the Internet. Having taken into consideration the broader internet environment through trends analysis, as well as progress achieved towards 2025 targets, the Internet Society leadership determined that it would prioritize four strategic objectives for the year 2022. Number one, extend the internet to communities that do not have it and need it most. Number two, promote the internet model of networking as the preferred model. Number three, counter attempts by leading government to undermine encryption. And number four, defend against shutdowns by increasing cross-border connectivity and resiliency. Our community members were invited to take an online survey. In addition, top tier organization members were invited to a one-on-one -on -one consultation meeting. Via the community consultation, our community members were asked three questions. How important to you are each of the 2022 priorities? How likely are you to become involved in the 2022 priorities? And are you already doing work related to the priorities? And if so, which ones? The purpose of asking these questions is to understand community alignment on the priorities and to identify opportunities for collaboration that would enhance our collective impact on the internet where staff are working with community to achieve this impact. The results gained from the responses would inform the design of 2022 projects and initiatives by Internet Society staff. So the survey spanned three weeks. It went out to all our community members who were contactable. There are more, but they chose not to be contactable. It had a blend of qualitative and quantitative response types and the survey was done in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. The exception is that the organization members received the English version only. The survey required authentication for the first time to improve data integrity to support better analysis. Quantitative data was analyzed according to community segment and region, and this is standard practice for us. Also, qualitative data was analyzed for common phrasing, unique themes, and emerging patterns. So here's the response rate. We received 509 responses from individual members. That's less than 1% of total recipient, but it's actually better than last year's response rate. We also received seven responses from organization members. That's 8% of total recipients in that category. In terms of regional breakdown of respondents, Africa had the most respondents and Middle East had the least. This is consistent with the global distribution of our overall membership. Europe and North America were the only regions represented by organization members which is where a combined 69% of organization members are based. And so we come to the findings of the consultation. Finding number one, individual members regard the priorities as important and they are likely to become involved. Finding number two, organization members regard the priorities as important as well, but they are not as likely as individual members to become involved. And here's finding number three, 
our community is already doing interesting work related to the priorities. 36% of individual member respondents are already doing work related to at least one of the priorities, and 57% of organization member respondents are already doing work related to at least one of the priorities. Other takeaways. Overall, respondents find all four priorities to be important. Individual and organization members find extend as the most important and promote as the least important. Overall, our community is already involved or wants to become involved in our priorities. Although individual members were least likely to become involved with extend, it is the priority for which the highest percentage of individual members are currently doing work at 24%. In terms of promote, there is lack of clarity about the internet model of networking. Many survey respondents ask for clearer description. And this survey was the first use of authentication in a survey to community members. The extra step needed to provide feedback may have affected the response rate. And now we go into the findings of whether respondents believe the priorities are important to them. It's just a slight elaboration of what you had just heard in terms of the findings. On how important to you are each of the following priorities for 2022, for individual members, the results are extremely positive with 80% and above finding each priority to be extremely or very important. For individual members, most important priority is extent, least important priority is promote. For organization members, the results indicate that they align with our priorities, with promote as the outlier. The most important priority is a three-way tie between extend, counter, and defend, and the least important priority is promote. And now we go into the findings on whether respondents are likely to get involved in the priorities area of work. And again, it is just a slight elaboration of what you had just heard earlier. On how likely are you to become involved in the 2022 priorities for individual members overall, they are interested in becoming involved with nearly the same level of interest across priorities. They are most likely to become involved in counter and least likely to become involved in extent. For organization members overall, the results indicate organization members are more likely to be involved in extent and counter. Promote is the outlier. They are most likely to become involved in extent or counter, it's a two-way tie, and least likely to become involved in promote. And here's the key findings on work already being done, and you had already heard the statistics. 36% of individual members are already doing work related to the priorities. Most of them are working on extend, and they are least working on promote work already being done by organization members, 57% of all respondents are already working or involved in areas related to the priorities. And now we come to the key themes from open-ended responses, and this is where it gets quite interesting. Now, these comments are highlighted by the analysis team as most frequently mentioned or popular among the respondents. The differing points of view within our community on aspects of extend, promote, counter, and defend are key reflection points and need to be discussed among staff, particularly the points about the internet model. There is also this doubt in the community among some members that ISOC may not be able to make much of a difference in connectivity, in extending the internet to communities that need it most. And I think that requires a discussion. Under counter, which is countering the um, efforts of leading government in countering encryption, there are various points of view in terms of how that needs to be done. And also under defend, there are also various points of view from the community on how that should be approached. And here we come to key findings from organization members in the top two tiers. Four organization members participated in the one-on-one -on -one consultation. They are right NCC, donut slash affiliates. This is how they usually refer to themselves when they representative, when their representative are participating in our, in our meetings. 
Ericsson, and Amazon. Here are the key findings from the one-on-one -on -one consultations with organization members. The four organization members had mostly positive reactions to the priorities. They want more than the action plan process or consultations as a feedback mechanism, and they prefer two-way discussions between the internet society and its members. In their view, the action plan should be where ISOC designs its priorities with its members. RIPE NCC acknowledges that it needs to address the impacts internet policy and regulations have on its organization and members, and this ties in with what um, the Internet Society is working on. Donuts is focusing on DNS security and internet abuse and sees opportunities for ISOC to grow in that space. They are also looking to build synergy, have more interactions and discussions and listening sessions between members and the Internet Society. Ericsson would like to have more clarity on the Internet Society's project narratives and scope of work to get buy-in from management maintain ISOC membership and create opportunities for future collaboration. And finally, Amazon would like to explore more collaboration between the Internet Society and their Amazon Quipper team on growing the globally connected internet. In terms of organization member priorities, the four participating organization members also shared their corporate priorities that are in line with ISOC's 2022 priorities, and you can see them on this slide. And finally, we reach the appendix, which contains the email that was sent to the ISOC community by our CEO, Andrew Sullivan, regarding the 2022 priorities. And this is the end of the consultation findings report. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to discussions with the board on the Action Plan 2022 priorities. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, first of all, a very warm welcome to our incoming board members. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. And a heartfelt thank you to our um, outgoing board members as well. In this presentation today, I will talk you through a proposal for changes to the individual membership model, um, along with the prerequisites, uh, dependencies, as well as a roadmap for implementing the proposed changes. This proposal is an iteration from a previous one that was presented to the board in 2020 and incorporates the feedback provided by the board at that time. Before diving in, let me give you a little bit of context and uh, some of the background. So in 2020, um, the presentation to the board, we presented options for a paid individual membership by offering dedicated new services. And the feedback we received at the time was that we needed to reassess the proposition and not create any additional products or services to recruit individual members, that complex membership structures that would require expensive governance and compliance um, operationalization should be avoided. And that, and finally, that an initial focus should be on uh, increasing participation and engagement of members. Since then, the community engagement team has focused on identifying and carrying out some quick win improvements to the current membership experience. Whilst we were carrying out some further um, consultations and assessments to revise the proposition for individual membership. The main changes that we carried out um, have included an improved member join experience, the implementation of better member support by deploying a fresh desk ticketing system to improve handling and tracking of inquiries and requests from our members, an improved newsletter, which I hope you all uh, have seen and, and are receiving, uh, which is also improving our communication experience. The, and lastly, the implementation of analytics and feedback loops to constantly improve communication in general, but um, newsletters in particular, um, and content going forward. One thing we um, really focused our efforts on was to listen to our members and to really get a better understanding of our current membership base, their needs, but also to comparatively looking at um, understanding our membership model. So a couple of things have happened to uh, address this. So last December, we conducted a community communication audit. Um, this audit has highlighted the need for better planned and coordinated approach to uh, community communication. 
including to our members. And as a result of this, we've improved internal coordination, but also the planning of email communication to our members and chapters. Since January, um, we are consulting our memberships through a number of channels. One is a quantitative survey, which uh, was launched in, uh, was conducted in January, and which is currently being complemented with qualitative interviews um, that are actually happening just as I as I record this uh, this presentation. We also conducted a benchmarking research and landscape analysis to look at other membership structures. Um, we're finalizing the report, but already some of the findings are reflected uh, in, uh, in this proposal. As you probably have seen, um, as at least I hope you've seen, we've also updated um, our data privacy program, which is currently in consultation phase with our chapters. And these changes will allow for better communication with members. We um, also did an initial analysis of the pre-requirement of joining global uh, membership before being able to join a chapter. There's lots of dependencies with the data privacy uh, program, so uh, we will share this with you and with the community um, probably September, October timeframe. So after the completion of the, the data privacy policy updates. So this is high level where we are today. Um, I'd like now to take you to the proposed strategy going forward, um, as well as the proposed model. So I wanted to start with um, actually looking at what the issues are that we're actually trying to solve. So what we see is that we don't really have a cohesive community as such, but rather a lot of individuals in our database. So Internet Society currently has nearly 80,000 global members, but many current members have signed up because membership is a pre-requirement qualification for other programs or processes. Um, with, a, with an unclear value proposition for incoming members, we're currently unable to offer a really a positive experience that fosters that feeling of community and, and creates this community that is engaged with our mission, but also with each other in pursuit of that mission. So the lack of a clear value proposition also reflects in the lack of an organized and coordinated cross team approach to the membership base. So we see that current interactions with individuals, with individual members in particular are not coordinated across the teams, which results in, in patchy engagements that doesn't really build up on previous engagements to deliver a consistent community experience. Often there's also no real differentiation between a member and what we could call an unidentified audience or, or, un, or non-members basically. So based on that, let me take you what our mission statement really is for individual membership. We're looking at creating an engaged and vibrant global movement of motivated members that help internet society achieve its goals. Now, how do we get there? Um, Internet Society has a great and inspiring mission. We hear that a lot in the feedbacks that uh, we've done through the survey, but now also through the, uh, through the interview sessions. The work we do really makes a difference globally and people see that. Um, it makes a difference in people's lives. Um, members recognize that. And because of that, or I should say thanks to that, we already attract a wide range of people globally. What we do see is that through several consultations done over the past few years, including the one uh, earlier this year, the individual members have repeated the same expectation again and again and again. They desire more engagement and involvement with Internet Society and with our work. It is contingent on Internet Society to provide our members with the right conditions, but also the right spaces and real opportunities to engage with our work as well as with each other. So the outcome we're looking for is a membership base that feels genuinely connected to our mission um, with a community that helps each other and is ready to contribute to our Internet Society's projects, initiatives, and ultimately also revenue. Now to get to the outlined uh, mission statements, we outlined the goals for membership. And so we're looking at keeping the membership base informed, motivated and interested in Internet Society's work, to change the passive engagement to active engagement and meaningful engagement, to match members to peers on topics or themes of mutual interest, to match members to Internet Society's work that is of interest to them, 
to help various internet society teams achieve their goals and targets. And important to note that at this stage, we're looking mostly um, at engaging current members and so that recruitment is really a secondary uh, goal. To achieve these goals, we'll need to provide a number of benefits. Uh, the main promise is really a curated, tailored and service oriented experience. We need to provide a great community features that allow for easy discovery of an interaction with like minded people. We need to have a two way conversational engagement with member and not just talking at members, but really listen to and actually have a two way uh, engagement set up. We need to deliver content and interactions specifically tailored to, men to members. And we need to create opportunities to contribute to Internet Society's work. So that is looking at volunteer engagements, but also uh, looking at how people can contribute at local level um, to Internet Society's work. In terms of model, um, we actually recommend to have a free membership. Now we had discussions, uh, we looked at uh, options of paid membership uh, as we discussed it in, in the last board meeting in 2020, but there's a number of reasons for which we came back from that. So paid membership plans um, raise expectations of services and products that has exclusivity and premium attached to them. So taking the board's feedback into, con in into consideration, creation of new products and services were not really an option. And so, simply putting a paid wall to information, content, or features that are currently available for free would not be received well by our community. Another option that we looked at is to offer discounts on value or on value added services, like for example, training courses or have paid member only courses. However, what this would mean is that we would have a quite a heavy reliance on other teams to deliver what the paid members would value. And that would affect the main goals of those teams. So the other challenge we saw for paid membership is that our volumes actually don't justify the investment. So um, setting up a paid membership model comes with a high initial cost that would include um, additional personnel on top of what uh, will be needed for a free membership model to provide service, to provide support to paid members. It would imply additional costs for handling payments, renewals, transactions, account management. And it would also include overheads for processes like compliance and cost attribution. So the additional resources would not only be on the community engagement side, but also from uh, other teams like finance, collaborative systems, IT, legal. Um, so it would actually increase the, the resource um, cost quite extensively. And based on the current level of our membership base, it would be very difficult to break even and making this profitable. Um, making this profitable. So our conclusion and recommendation is to have a simple offer of free membership, which in turn, we can then use as a resource to help other internet society teams achieve their goals. Free membership um, still creates the need and an expectation of certain membership benefits. Um, if not, there's no reason for members to actually join. So we looked at the needs and wants of members and have organized those along four categories, uh, which would cover the interest of a wide variety of target audiences. Um, and that is really what together that actually articulates the value proposition for membership. We then looked at existing features to offer, and even if some may need to be tailored uh, to the membership audience, they would not require heavy benefit or feature developments as advised by the board last year. So the four benefit buckets, as I can, if I can call them like that, um, are creating a sense of community and a sense of belonging, um, features and efforts for members to connect, collaborate, exchange, and learn from peers with similar interests and passion, to create a sense of belonging. Um, on the slides, um, as well as in the written documents, you will uh, be able to find some examples of, of the features that actually uh, we are considering uh, under each of those benefits. The second benefit um, is delivery of curated uh, relevant and timely content for the individual member community. The third bucket is opportunities to participate and contribute to a movement that creates impact for the good of the internet. 
And last but not least, uh, opportunities that would help individual members improve their career prospects. And so while um, recruitment is not the main priority, um, I still wanted to touch upon who our target audience for membership would be, as that will define the makeup and the level of engagement uh, of our individual community. So our primary target audience for membership and for the membership team would be those who are already interested in Internet Society's work, uh, that are already persuaded by what we are doing, um, and that are showing high levels of interest and or engagement. And so we will rely on the marketing and communications teams to increase awareness on, of Internet Society's work, make people interested in Internet Society's work, attract them to the touch points and increase their engagement there before we then would target them for conversion to individual membership. Now, concretely, um, where do we start? So we recommend to keep the focus on of individual membership program to activities that provide a smooth member join experience that links up with the prospect's journey before they sign up uh, as members. So before they start the signing up process. We are uh, also recommending activities that are tailored onboarding experience to help newly signed up members immediately connect with the organization and their area of interest, but also to ensure alignment uh, we see that a lot of our mem current members, actually, there's, I wouldn't say a misalignment, but there's a bit of finding out where they fit and, uh, and how they align, how their desires of actually making an impact really align with Internet Society's uh, mission and goals. Um, we would then look at a personalized experience on the uh, online member engagement platform, which is currently called Connect. Uh, we would foster the communities within the community with a steady stream of content, high quality engagement and opportunities for them to contribute. Again, this is volunteer opportunities or uh, ways to engage in, uh, in the work that is already uh, planned by uh, the Internet Society staff. Uh, a committed effort to animate and to support the community and a constant analysis of member activity and preferences to drive continued improvement of the, the features and the benefits that we outlined. What we will need um, for this program to meet its objectives and to be successful is clear ownership of individual membership experience. And so we strongly recommend that this be fully mandated to the community engagement team to drive. Um, the community engagement to champion the needs of individual members within the internet society, um, to coordinate with the various internet society teams to deliver engagement and content to the members. It's imperative that the whole organization is behind it and that, uh, it, that everybody supports this initiative. We will need the commitment from all dependent teams at Internet Society to provide resources, material, engagement opportunities for members. So it's really a, an, an all hands on deck um, uh, initiative. The, there will, of course, tool, be the need for tools and systems with high levels of automation to reduce manual interventions and task load. And I'll get into a little bit more detail um, a little bit later. Uh, this would also include data analysis and then staffing, uh, of course, to support the individual members um, commu membership community. Now, I mentioned the dependencies on all of Internet Society for this to be successful. Um, this slide gives you a sense of what that means. I will not go through the detail here. You have this information in the documents. I shared the PowerPoints and the Word documents. Um, the, this is just to give you a sense of the types of dependencies uh, that we will, uh, we will face to deliver a great membership experience. Um, let me quickly touch as well on the uh, resources that would be needed. So we are looking at, uh, for, to run the membership program successfully, we would need two full-time employees. Um, now we looked at um, internally actually reallocating, reallocating some staff to support this. Um, we have moved Stina Philipson already into the role of individual membership manager. And so she was very instrumental in, in implementing some of those low hanging fruits um, improvements that I mentioned earlier. And then um, we will have um, Leah Kiesling who will be reallocated to individual membership. And so we will, uh, we will, uh, look at how we can uh, distribute her current tasks across the team or, or reprioritize some of those things. Um, in terms of tools and systems, um, again, this is quite a detailed slide, uh, but in essence, this 
identifies what we need to be able to, uh, to do. And uh, we have been and will continue to work very closely with the collaborative systems team to identify and implement the specific tools. Uh, some of those are already in place. Some of them are part of the system upgrade project that Collaborative Systems is working on. And so we will we then prioritize uh, those systems accordingly. And last but not least, a uh, high level timeline for the rollout of the program. So the rest of 2021 will be dedicated to finalizing some of the research that will help us shape the benefits and features. Um, define the system requirements, uh, as I just mentioned, with collaborative systems, and frankly, just um, evaluating, mapping, and implementing some some of the missing or some of the broken foundational processes related to membership. So we are we are doing quite a thorough analysis in terms of compliance, but also in terms of your user experience, and uh, and looking at some of the flows in terms of processes. So this is the, the end of the presentation. Uh, there's two slides here with some additional information and that we pulled from uh, the survey. I will let you look at that um, at your, uh, at your own, uh, at your own, in your own time. But uh, thank you for watching the recording and um, I'm, looking here, I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback and to see you all very soon. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sebastian Belagamba. I'm the Vice President of External Engagement. And I would like to give you a brief on the new fellowship programs that we are running and about to run at the Internet Society. As a matter of a background, in 2019, we conducted an assessment of uh, our fellowship programs. And that resulted in the proposition of uh, two new fellowship programs that would incorporate the ones that we were already running back, back then. And um, in 2020, we consulted the community with a proposal for two new fellowships. One that is called now the Early Career Fellowship was then uh, called the Youth Fellowship, was renamed since then. And the second one, which is uh, called the Mid-Career Fellowship. The Early Career Fellowship has already been launched. It's been running for a month now, and so far it has been very successful. The Early Career Fellowship is scheduled to start in mid-2022, uh, and the curriculum is being developed as we speak. The community liked the, the programs as, as we presented them, and the board approved both of them to, for execution. The Early Career Fellowship, the uh, vision for the Early Career Fellowship is to empower the internet champions of tomorrow so they can contribute to the development of the internet while they ensure that the internet remains open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy. We have uh, basically three goals with, uh, with this fellowship. One is capacity building. Uh, we want to create the capacity in this internet champ in this, for these internet champions. The, the, to empower, um, as a second goal, uh, a, cradle, a cradle of, uh, of uh, talented internet uh, professionals that will represent the missions and ambition of the internet society, and to ensure that the next generation of internet champions uh, know and embrace the principles of openness and collaboration, the internet way of working. In this graphic, you can see uh, an idea of the four uh, modules that we have divided the Early Career Fellowship. Um, <clears throat> in the timeline, you can see that uh, the onboarding started in and the week one for the fellowship started in, in June 28th. And there is basically four modules that are being run. The fellows are now at the end of the first module which is the Internet Ecosystem, which is conducted by Dr. Laura, Laura Dinardis. Um, there is um, a second model coming after that, uh, which is uh, led by the Oxford Internet Institute. In, and it's a um, model on the internet way of thinking. Uh, project management and advocacy is, on, is, is those skills that we want to learn them to, to tell them uh, and for them to learn in the, in the third module. And the internet way of doing, 
something that we are conducting in conjunction with the with Diplo Foundation is going to be the final model of the of this uh, fellowship. This uh, each of these uh, fellowships consists of a cohort of fifteen fellows. So we are planning to run two cohorts a year, and for now it's a hundred percent virtual. In order to uh, deliver this first uh, fellowship, the Early Career Fellowship, we have a partner with uh, important institutions. I mentioned Dr. Laura, uh, Laura Denardis, the, the, the American uh, University, the Oxford Internet Institute, Pyramid Learning and 89 Up, and Deeper Foundation. We have uh, secured some sponsors like ICANN Broadpeak, Trust Elevate Verizon. Uh, we are still waiting for more to come on board. And we have also um, um, been able to secure the support of uh, as guest speakers of many other organizations. <clears throat> you can see the pictures here of uh, our first cohort of um, fellows, which started the early career program. Uh, they were selected, uh, there's 15 uh, in each cohort, as I said before, uh, and they were selected out of uh, 164 candidates that presented, uh, uh, submitted a, an application for, for this round. I will give you some uh, information about our, our fellows now. <clears throat> the majority of our fellows come from uh, Asia and Africa. Uh, with some from, from the Americas in general. And they have 53% of them are individual members of the Internet Society, 27% are chapter members, and the other 20% are uh, either organizational members or non members of the Internet Society until the moment they started this, this uh, program. 47% of them are female, 53% are male. And 87%, which means 13 out of 15 fellows, are on an age uh, range of 20 to 29. The other two are over 30, but less than 39. You can see <clears throat> in these pictures uh, where are they coming from in terms of uh, the sector they, they work on, on, on the study. 40% uh, of them are from uh, civil society, and the second most important groups are the technical community and the business sector with 20% uh, each. Uh, the majority of our fellows, one third of the, of the fellows come from social sciences. Um, and the majority, I mean, three, two thirds of them have a bachelor's degree and one quarter of them roughly have a, a master's degree. There are some comments positive in the that we can we could gather in these first weeks of uh, of the program. Um, so you can say that uh, all the fellows are very excited to be part of this program and looking forward to to the outcome. And that's it for for the early career fellowship. Um, I will give you some information about the incoming one, which is uh, the mid career fellowship that is still in development and it's going to be launched in 2022. We are developing the, the program at this moment. We, uh, in the final two months of 2021, we will develop the content <clears throat> and prepare for, for the program to, to be launched. And we will launch the program in February, uh, in the February, April, 2022 timeframe. With, a, with an application call and a, a selection process. And we plan to start, actually start the program in May or June in 2022. With that, uh, I would like uh, to thank you for your time and uh, uh, I will be at your disposal if uh, in case there is uh, any comments or questions. Thank you very much and I'll give you all my best. Hey everyone, my name is Christy Mason, Head of Marketing Communications. And I'm James Wood, Head of Content Communications. 
Uh, we're both very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about what we are doing collectively to build and strengthen the Internet Society's reputation. Uh, we know that some new board members may not have all of the, all of the context for this work, um, but uh, we've tried to strike a balance in the following slides between an appropriate level of scene setting and a current view of where we are today in our plans. Um, we hope you find this presentation helpful. And of course, we look forward to answering uh, your questions uh, during the forthcoming meeting. Thank you, James. So um, last year felt sort of like this photo here. There was the tidal wave of negativity around the proposed sale of PIR that was happening amidst a global pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement. The pandemic and the civil unrest, while both unfortunate, pr did provide the Internet Society uh, a platform to talk about the Internet, which was proven to be a, a big lifeline, as vital as the vaccine and, and voices being heard. And it really allowed us to move the conversation from the sellers of .org to that of the Internet Society being a trusted and strong voice for a bigger and stronger Internet. So while it felt like we were walking a tightrope and a thousand feet in the air, the sentiment numbers indicated that we were able to really neutralize the .org conversation. And so we closed out 2020 with 78% neutral media sentiment and around 45% neutral social media sentiment. And sentiment was the measurement indicator that we were using through the sale well, the proposed sale to understand how we were doing from a brand reputation perspective. So with the proposed sale conversation neutralized, we really set our, we set our sites to rebuild our reputation with a focus on being more effective in uh, what we say and how we say it, and, and really to a larger audience so that they could once again see the Internet Society as a global community working towards building and promoting and defending a bigger and stronger internet, which is so much more than the guardians of .org. So to achieve our vision, we started um, looking inside first. So we changed our approach to communications, which naturally in any new approach meant changing the structure of our team. So what we had done was we created one team, obviously the marketing communication or the content and marketing team, but what we did was create two divisions. We had one division focused on the content and another, focus, another, another division focused on the channels of content distribution. So thus we became the content and marketing communications team, or as you see here, CMC is what we commonly refer to ourselves as. So while we are these divisions within one team, we work in constant collaboration. We make needed decisions together. And we, the divisions really focus on the two critical parts of communication coming together like a, some, like a relationship. These two teams are, are always together, mutually inclusive. And here you see our CMC unified purpose. And you can then see how it cascades the content team, unified purpose cascades and the content and the marketing communications team purpose cascades. Thank you, Christy. Um, so as Christy explains, um, we have a major focus on content as part of our current plan. Um, and that's because it's really a determining factor in everything we do. Everything that carries activity carries content and it's there as an enabler for our success. And when we talk about content um, in this respect, we really mean all of the things that we produce under the Internet Society banner. So everything from a tweet to a flagship report such as uh, the impact report that we do and everything in between. And through those products, uh, we carry content um, that becomes the currency of our ideas. And, and really it's the way that we do all the things that you see in, in the chart there in terms of building stronger, more strategic relationships, forging a stronger bond with our community, uh, playing, it uh, plays an important role in achieving positive outcomes for the internet through our project focus um, and of course we're perceived through the content that we create too so it plays a key role in building the perception of who we are and because of that it, it's the fuel that powers our brand reputation. 
So understanding uh, that and the importance of content to us, uh, 2020, as well as um, posing various challenges, actually afforded us an opportunity to, to stop and take a closer look at how well our content was working for us. And the answer to that question was that it could be working for us much harder. Our work uh, last year helped us to identify both the challenges and the opportunities for doing content better at the Internet Society. And that resulted in a plan for content, which we are now in the midst of implementing. And really this implementation plan that is our, our focus for 2021 is, can be thought of as, as quite a significant change effort for the organization because uh, ultimately we hope that it will make us much more effective, um, both through the use of our channels, which of course is the aspect that marketing communications uh, deals with and Christy leads, as well as the effectiveness of the, the content itself. That's, that's the ultimate goal. And really, uh, our plan this year is aimed at doing the, the, the things that you see on this slide, aimed at ensuring that our content is in tune and aligned with our strategic objectives. We want to make sure that we're putting our audiences first and not saying just what we want to say, but also balancing that need with what they want to hear. We want to be more efficient with our, our internal resources, our use of time, the, the money that we spend on content and activities, and of course the human resources and capital that we have too. A key one is that um, we are putting our content model and, and plan into place to increase the quality of content uh, over quantity. For too long, uh, we've produced a, a huge volume of uh, content without really uh, focusing it sufficiently on, on the quality and, and our whole plan is designed to ensure that we get um, the right content out there as opposed to as much content as we can. Then uh, we're in consort with marketing communications thinking very hard about the channels that we have and the interplay between content and those channels. So asking ourselves the important questions like what content should go on which channel? for what purpose, um, and not treating those things as separate pieces of the puzzle. puzzle. Then lastly, uh, putting clear guidance in place for what our content should look like and how we go about creating it. So in short, we're really creating a completely new content system that the Internet Society has always needed, but never had. And uh, we are in the middle of building that foundation, and the foundation um, is a, a we hope a long-term foundation and a permanent one for a better content future for the whole organization and the community. And our opportunity is to improve our content landscape from the ground up. So by that, we mean making improvements in all of the areas that you see listed there. We're putting governance and a governance framework in place that we have not had to direct uh, all of our content uh, choices and processes. Um, we're putting those processes in place to help us produce the content in the right way and to increase our efficiency, all the while making sure that it's the right content uh, uh, in a way that ladders up to our mission and our objectives. Um, we're creating resources to help uh, both our staff and others create uh, good quality content. And we're getting a better understanding of what content goes where as part of the choices we're making for our ecosystem and the ecosystem that we need to support our new content model. These fundamentals uh, we're putting in place now to do content well will allow us over time to strengthen and cement our reputation. And uh, we've made quite significant progress and headway with that in the first half of the year. We, we now have that governance framework in place. Um, we have a content vision and everything uh, ladders up to that vision, uh, which is essentially to craft content that inspire, to inspire, enable, and equip our various uh, supporters, champions, and allies to collaborate and advocate with us for an internet for everyone. That's the strategic core of our content strategy. It defines how content will help us achieve our mission. And to make sure that um, our content is aligned with that, we have a set of standards and principles and um, uh, categories with which our content must align. Those standards really hinge around the fact that um, we're ensuring that we are asking those key questions about content in the first place. What content should we be producing given the objectives we have? 
is this the right content? Does it fulfill a clear purpose? Who is it for? And will the content start new conversations or does it, does it feed into existing conversations? All of those kinds of questions will help us standardize the content that we're making. And it must align also with categories that we've set as part of our uh, content strategy. We also have uh, content principles as part of this governance framework that help us uh, not just make sure that our content is aligned, but also the processes that allow us to generate that content. And very, um, very briefly, those principles hinge around the notion that our content needs to be mission driven. We need to be good stewards of the time and resources we have available to us. Content, good content hinges on collaboration. Um, we always need to add value through our content. It's all about impact over quantity. And above all, uh, we need to be providing clarity through the content that we create. And that uh, idea of clarity is something I think that can directly impact rep reputation over time. Uh, moving on from uh, the fundamentals, um, we've done quite a lot of work already this year on the processes that uh, we are going to use to apply those fundamentals. So this really comes in the form of a uniform process for content production. And we've mapped it out at high level, uh, and it's this five step um, content production process that you see here that really has an emphasis on planning up front. So answering all those key strategic questions and at the very beginning, uh, before we generate any content, having a clear idea of why we need to generate it, how it will help, who it's for, and also the life cycle of that content. So making decisions at the, at the outset about how long that content should uh, be, be live, whether it needs to be archived or at some certain point, whether it needs to be maintained, etc. So we're thinking about its entire life cycle from, from the beginning. Uh, we're in a good place now with our, our development of all the processes. Um, we've got the high level framework in place. We're building out some of the detail in each of the phases and we're going to be moving forward to testing that workflow uh, as a critical component of making sure that it's the right one for us. Uh, beyond that, uh, we've also reached some quite major milestones in terms of the resources that we've created to help people generate good content. The first of those uh, was uh, what we have called the content toolkit, which we published in mid April, that really provides the guidance to, to manage content from idea to product. Um, it's a mechanism to ground ourselves in our content strategy, but also a manual for doing content well. And it contains the fundamentals, it contains uh, detail of our workflow, and it's the one-stop shop to help people understand how to generate content and the processes that um, they should be following. Um, beyond that, uh, we've also developed a style guide, which we uh, published publicly in June, because um, it's not just for our staff audience, other people who will help be helping us generate content need to reference it too. And this is really the place where our content conventions are set out. If there is any uh, argument about how things should be presented, what, what spelling we use, uh, what title, what case we use, how we go about um, uh, grammar, word usage, voice and tone, accessibility, et cetera, those multitude of issues, all of them are answered uh, by the style guide. So it's a really key resource that provides consistency across all the content that we will produce as the Internet Society. And then uh, just in terms of next steps, whilst we've hit a couple of milestones, there's still uh, quite a lot of work to do in the remainder of this year. We need to, as I say, make sure that our workflow is uh, appropriate for us, that it is robust enough, and to get it to a point through testing in Q3 and Q4 that we can activate it more broadly across the organization. The, the uh, goal right now is for our workflow to be sufficiently developed so that we can apply it in Q4 to plan our content for Q1. So really it's all about making sure that we're getting our content system to a place that it can be activated and used uh, as we embark on our 2022 work. Um, there are other considerations in here as well about um, making sure that we have a good sense of our channel strategy and our content model in order to make that work. Um, plus the delivery of a staff uh, development and training program to ensure that people know how to use uh, the principles, the standards, the resources, everything that we've, we're developing 
this year, because it's one thing to create those uh, assets, but it's quite another to ensure that people understand, understand them, understand their importance and know how to use them. So still quite a bit to do, but uh, we're on a good trajectory. Christy, Christy, back to you. All right, thank you very much, James. So <clears throat> while the content team is focused on what the Internet Society as an organization is saying, the marketing communications or Marcom team is focused on connecting what we are saying to the right audience and through the right mix of communication channels. Using our channels to broadcast messages and hope that the rightful receiver catches the message is just not an option in today's digital world. As the stat here on this slide indicates, the average person spends almost half of their day consuming content. So audiences are just not going to pick through the noise to get what they want. There is an expectation of audiences today that the content that they want will be put into their hands. So knowing who the audience is and the best way to reach them really increases Internet Society's effectiveness in achieving our mission. So as part of this, we are working on optimizing a core set of communication channels and helping teams target audiences so that the right people get the right message through the right channels in a way that it's very consistent with our brand and our tone of voice. So this slide here is an overview of our channel optimiz optimization strategy this year. The core channels of distribution, when we talk about it from a Marcom sense, is events, um, media relations, social media, and within social media at the global at the global level, we have four core social media channels, and then of course our website. So the event channel um, optimization strategy this year is really centered on um, uh, two things. One is evolving um, the, our, in our events so that they're a little bit more engaging. And second is to use this channel in a more effective way. So last year we conducted an audit. Uh, we, we pulled about 20 months worth of event data to better understand the use of this channel. And what the audit that we did revealed was that there was no common understanding uh, within staff um, about what constitutes an Internet Society event. And then um, the other interesting finding, while well, there are many, the other one of note is that there was, uh, we were involved in many events into the triple digits. However, less than 25% of those, we could apply any amount of ROI, even loosely. So what we did in, in the first half of this year was we outlined what constitutes an Internet Society event and established criteria for those events. And then as part, we created best practice guidelines so that staff who need to host an event or attend or do an event can do so in accordance with baseline Internet Society standards. So moving over to media relations, um, you know, besides keeping the media machine running across the globe on a daily basis, the media relations team is really focused on building awareness amongst newsrooms um, so that, you know, we can talk about trending news topics. Um, and, and obviously, we're doing this also through Internet Society Thought Leadership. So as part, the team is also training a larger, what I call depth of bench across internet staff to be able to talk about topics, news media topics, and to news media um, on internet policy and internet infrastructure. So this happens at the global level and also at the regional level so that when media calls, we can answer that call with our expertise. Moving over to social media, um, you know, we're really focused on increasing engagement uh, of our messages and also um, doing some uh, more core message amplification. So interestingly enough, there are over 45, uh, over 45 social media accounts that are linked to Internet Society Global. Um, so what the team has been doing is really looking at how we can build collaboration workflows amongst all the various channels and do so in a way that we can have some succinct messaging across the channels. Um, also encourage a more approachable tone of voice and test and share insights about new social media platforms um, and, and also new features. Uh, it seems like social, depending on the channel, they're coming out with new features almost on a daily basis. 
And then we're also doing things like um, providing our chapters, our extended social accounts, if you will, with uh, social toolkits on, on critical posts. And all of this, again, is in an effort to increase engagement and, and increase message amplification. So then moving over to the website, uh, what I consider, what I would consider to be our storefront, um, we've really taken a focus on uh, developing a road roadmap to highlight front end updates and SEO improvements, all in an effort to evolve uh, the user experience. So using some data that we collected through Google Analytics, we found that more than half of the visitors who came to our homepage left. This and other data points coupled with website best practice approach gave us our roadmap for the year. So you might've seen that recently refreshed our homepage and our navigation menus. This is part of the roadmap. Um, and you'll see more of these critical refreshes uh, happening throughout the back half of this year. So audience targeting, it's a bit of an art and science and each case is different depending on the audience you're trying to reach. So here we're presenting a case study, if you will, um, and it's on the economics of encryption, a report that was released by the encryption team earlier this year, because it's a really a great, a great case study to show the effectiveness of audience targeting. So this paper was written for policymakers, business decision makers, journalists, and encryption supporters. So identifying the right channel to target this audience and identifying the audience beyond those high level categories was critical to ensuring that all the efforts the team spent researching, writing and finalized got this paper in the right hands. And as you can see here in the results section that the targeting and targeting is always paid effort um, really outpaced organic by impressions, engagements, and clicks, um, all resulting in a seven minute average time on page, which is really a significant amount of time on page on any page. So 2021, how's it going? Um, let's take a look at how we're pulling this all together. Um, all of our efforts in the content side and the Marcom side from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. So first it's worth noting that we worked with the planning and reporting team to establish metrics for measuring our brand reputation on a continual basis. So we started by identifying the strategic pillars of the Internet Society brand. And when we say strategic pillars, we mean the character, characteristics of our brand and uh, how we want to be perceived in the world. So in the past, we would start with all the metrics we could measure in marketing and narrow down to a, to a select few based on perceived importance. Um, this approach worked, but the challenge was we were never able to benchmark year over year. So with a pillar-based approach, we were able to apply one to two data metrics representative of each pillar, taking into account the need to establish a set of metrics that we can measure year over year. So as you see here on this slide, um, we have our three pillars, trusted, credible, and relevant. And for trusted, we're going to measure media mentions, for Credible, we have two measurements, which is uh, inbound media inquiries and also domain authority ranking. And then for relevancy, we're going to look at average social media post engagements. So we'll take a look on the next couple of slides how we're doing. So from a trusted perspective, the number of media mentions, as you can see here, we earned uh, this in the first half of this year, a little over 600 media mentions, which is a very sharp decline from last year. And this is primarily due to the proposed sale of PIR and ICANN's decision to block the proposed sale. Now of those 402 media mentions, almost 40% were headlines and features on topics that strategically align with our organizational priorities. So while the mentions last year were higher, the quality and topics of those were far less relevant to us than what we're seeing this year. And of course, we always like to call out top tier media mentions as these are pretty coveted. So as you can see here, we did get a headline feature in the Times India. Uh, you also see that uh, we got a very nice feature on community networks and indigenous communities on Mashable. And then there's also a feature here on MSN on encryption and keeping people safe online. From a credible perspective, um, 
again, you're going to see the effect of the proposed sale of PIR on media metrics be a recurring theme that will continue this year and into next year until we, we remove this variable from our benchmark. So really, the, again, the proposed sale of PIR really explains the decrease from 44 mentions last year or from 44 inbound inquiries last year to 15 this year. Also, another factor in the sharp decline is the trending news cycle. So last year at this time, if you remember, there was lockdowns, there was a heavy reliance on the internet to keep society employed, educated, healthy, entertained, informed, and most of all, connected. So moving on to domain ranking authority, um, some of you may know this, um, but to explain just a little bit, domain ranking authority shows the, th the strength of the website's backlink profile compared to others on a hundred point scale. It's really important because it represents the website, how a website is doing in terms of search engines and how the search engine is seeing you. And then the domain ranking authority anywhere between 40 and 50 is considered average, not bad. Anything between 50 and 60 is considered good. Anything over, consist, over 60 is considered excellent. So as you can see here, last year to this year, at this time we are uh, remain steady in our high ranking. And this is really important to us because search is the number one driver of, of inbound views to our website. Now you can see the chart on the far left shows a number of backlinks that we currently have on our website and how high those ba those backlink backlinks excuse me uh, rank on on our website. So from a relevant perspective, again, we're looking at average social media post engagements across our four core global channels. And we really have a, a focus this year on um, testing new approaches. And as you can see, the testing new approaches really got us to the 21 increase in our average post engagement over this time last year. So what we did differently. So last year, we were really focused on posts that explain internet terminology. And this year, we tested things like emojis, um, as you can see by the image on the left. And uh, this one was actually our most engaged post, as least as far back as we can go on both Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then the other thing, you know, another thing to call out that we're testing is the new features. And here you see um, an image from LinkedIn where LinkedIn is offering this feature where you can directly embed PDFs into a post. So the user benefit is that they don't, a user doesn't have to go off of the LinkedIn platform onto a website. And what we're finding here is when we add PDFs or any sort of content directly into the post, keeping them on the LinkedIn platform, it is our most engaged posts on LinkedIn cons consistently through this half of the, the for this first half of the year. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to James. Thank you, Christy. So I just want to create the link again back to content because of course content uh, has a really important role to play in, in creating brand perception and in contributing to our brand pillars of trusted, credible and relevant. So our content needs to work well for us to achieve that brand reputation. And we want to understand if it's, if it's doing that. So there are a number of things from a content uh, perspective that we have begun to measure and look at um, uh, that tell us whether our content is being effective in creating the outcomes we want for our brand. The first of those is um, the level of community participation, and this is linked to uh, the measures that exist in the community engagement team, um, because there is a target there to um, achieve uh, in terms of the number of individual members participating in our projects and initiative, and clearly content is a key driver for that. Um, we also want to get a better sense of our audience satisfaction, specifically around the content and what people feel about the content. And we've begun to collect some uh, data on this. Uh, we are measuring, for example, uh, the positive response rate in our individual member newsletters. Um, and in Q2, we've had uh, uh, a number of people writing in proactively to us, which is essentially what that positive response rate means. Whereas really we had, we had nothing like that before. So uh, any measure there is, um, is a, a bonus to us and it's showing us that um, people are appreciate, appreciative of the content that they're now getting and they're actually going out of their way to say so. Um, and then lastly, uh, 
the degree on the amount of strategic content that we carry through our channels, most notably our website. Um, one of the things that the content strategy uh, and audit work that we did last year flagged was that there was a significant portion up to 80% of our content across the website, and that's thousands of pages that wasn't always strategically connected to our work. So we want to um, re reverse that. We want to make sure that the, the vast majority of our content on our website is strategic. And that will happen through a combination of creating strategic content, um, as well as archiving and maintaining that content uh, that is no longer strategic to what we're doing. And then we'll finish uh, just with a couple of examples of, uh, of some of this work in action and, and how Marcom and content are coming together to, to bring about these changes. Um, you've heard Christy mention um, the website refreshes, uh, changes to the navigation on the website, but also changes to the content. Um, and uh, this is um, making a difference. It's being felt uh, quite far and wide at the moment in that um, we've really changed our, our, our language. We've changed our, our approach to a lot of the information we have in some key places on the website, and we've made it much more audience friendly. Uh, in addition, uh, we're very conscious that we need to create uh, content that tells this, the bigger story and not just the story of our projects, but how those individual pieces of work ladder up to uh, the, the internet that we're trying to um, create in terms of making it bigger and making it stronger. And then lastly, uh, there's an example here about um, beginning to see a return on investment from uh, the content, that, uh, those content changes that we're making. One of those is the individual member newsletter, as I say, that we're beginning to track. We're, we're tracking the response rates from that. But also, uh, ultimately, it's about what people then do with that content. Um, and that return on investment is really in the translation of content to action, because ultimately, it's the action that we want. And there's a nice anecdotal uh, reference here about someone who, who appreciates receiving that content and because of that content is now participating in a meeting to help plan Global Encryption Day. The second example is, again, content related in that um, this person is is saying that they're proud to be an Internet Society member and they're highlighting their, to their own network the, the, the things that we have done in 2020 to create positive outcomes for the Internet. And uh, I would encourage everyone to have a look at that impact report from 2020 because it's a really great example of the kind of content that we believe can drive our reputation and that we uh, need to do more of. So. Uh, Content and communications uh, and marketing communications are committed to continuing to work hand in hand to increase our reputation in, in these ways um, and use the power of content and the effective, efficient use of channels to do that. Um, Christy and I would like to thank you very much uh, for listening and uh, we look forward to talking to you uh, at the forthcoming board meeting. Yes, thank you very much. Thank Bye you. now. Recording. Thank you. Uh, so I don't see any res uh, anyone responding saying that they are interested in serving as chair. So uh, we'll have to uh, break now. Um, uh, oh wait, before we do that, I wonder whether Ted would like to say something about uh, uh, about his candidacy as the chair. Uh, thanks to each of you for your uh, service on the board. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, and I, I simply wanted to, to let you know that I believe strongly in the mission of the society and that um, as chair, if you decide to elect me, I will do my best to make sure that the board is an effective actor um, in helping the society um, move forward on that mission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted. I see that Mohammed is joining. So um, uh, when he joins, I will um, pause for a moment and uh, ask whether he wishes to exp uh, express a desire to run uh, for the chair position, just to um, cover all the bases. Uh, Mohammed, can you hear us? 
Muhammad, you may be muted. Uh, yes, and do I get hear you? Can you hear me? Uh, sometimes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you fine. Uh, so I was okay. just calling um, the election uh, of the chair, and I wanted to make sure uh, whether you wished to express uh, a desire to serve as chair in the next year. Uh, we have had the expression from Ted. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm not interested as now to serve as chair, so I'm happy with Ted. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, so now we have to run an election, which means that um, uh, we, we pause and all, uh, all attendees right now who are not voting members, not voting trustees or me, um, have to leave the meeting. Uh, so um, uh, Kevin will um, ask everybody to uh, step out of the meeting who is not a voting trustee. Uh, and, um, uh, and when he has done that, I will um, uh, open the uh, discussion uh, among you uh, for anything you want to say uh, um, about Ted. Ted, also, I would ask that you uh, step out during this um, discussion. Yes, this works a lot better in person. We're waiting for Sarah and Renalia and Ilona to leave the meeting. And Kevin, I assume you can stop the broadcast to the non-panelists. Yes, we are. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, the board uses an online voting platform for the elections, and Kevin has uh, configured the electronic ballots and sent them to everyone. Uh, so the um, uh, ballots have been distributed to the trustees. Uh, you should see it in board effect. If you do not see it in board effect, try refreshing your page. It's at the very bottom of the homepage. And Kevin will display the results when the, um, when the election is completed, when all the ballots have been received. Sorry, uh, Kevin, I did not see it. it. If you scroll down to the bottom of your homepage, you should see polls and surveys, and then vote for board chair. I tried refreshing your your screen too. Polls and surveys. Is anyone else having difficulty finding the? I am having difficulty. Okay. I'm willing to make my vote public, deliver it verbally. It should appear at the bottom of your uh, your screen under polls and surveys. Uh, uh, George, if you click on the left hand side, it says home. Yeah, I've click got the it. home refresh, and then and then refresh the screen, and then when you scroll all the way to the bottom, it has a section called polls, 
I really you. refreshed. Thank you, it's done. Yes, thank you. That should be the same cycle you go through for the other votes this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I did it, Kevin. Do you see my vote poll? I don't see individual polls. I just see uh, that um, we have all but one one ballot received. All but one. Okay. Maimuna, did you find it? Okay. I have all 12. Would you like me to display the results? Yes, please. Okay. With 12 votes, 12 out of 12 for Ted Hardy as chair. So. Thank you very much, Ted, for your willingness to serve and uh, congratulations. The uh, vote is unanimous. Uh, so uh, at this point, I will um, uh, hand uh, the role presiding on this meeting over to, uh, over to Ted. But before I do that, I uh, wanted to offer you the feedback from, uh, from the board uh, in their discussion. Uh, the, the, the board is thankful and appreciates your willingness to serve and believes you will do an excellent job, but wanted to remind you that uh, all of the rest of the trustees are here to call upon should you need their assistance. So please don't hesitate to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both for the confidence in taking up this new role and for the willingness to serve. Uh, our, our next agenda item is in fact our next election. It is the election of the other officers. There are two agenda items underneath that. Uh, one is the confirmation of the decision on the board secretary role and the second is the election of the treasurer. Uh, since the confirmation doesn't require um, any change to the, uh, to the group here, why don't we do that first? Uh, as folks will recall, we discussed in working board meetings uh, uh, the fact that since Ilona has taken up the role of corporate secretary, that having her also take the role of board secretary or not appointing a separate board secretary uh, would make sure that the, uh, the full set of uh, trustees were always able to focus on the work of the board rather than stopping and taking notes and, and doing that sort of thing instead. Uh, as a result, we proposed uh, not to fill the role of board secretary at this time. Is there anybody who wishes to revisit that decision? Okay, uh, seeing no issues with that, we'll, we'll call that decision confirmed and now move to the election of the treasurer. Uh, as Andrew pointed out, uh, there was a previous uh, message from John Levine uh, asking for expressions of interest. And during that, uh, Laura expressed interest in the role of treasurer and there were none, no other expressions of interest at that time. Is there anybody else who wishes to express interest in the role of treasurer at this time? Seeing none, we'll now go through the same process that you just went through. Uh, Laura will ask you to step aside. And uh, Kevin, if anybody else has joined us as an observer in this short period, we'll ask them to step uh, as well. OK, I would last ask any attendees to leave the meeting room, leave the webinar. Um, also, those of you on staff that are in the meeting, thank you. I'm. Thanks. Okay. Just to remind folks of the board effect dance, it is click on home in the top left, then refresh your browser and scroll all the way to the bottom. And there should be a vote for treasurer pool there. perhaps board treasurer to line with line the new bylaws.
Kevin, whenever the, the set of votes is complete, feel free to just go ahead and display the results for us. Okay, here are the results. We have 12 out of 12 votes for Laura Thompson as treasurer. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for agreeing to serve in the role and congratulations. Um, during the discussion, uh, there was every confidence expressed in your ability to do the job and a great deal of appreciation for your willingness to take it on. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, and thank you, everyone. Uh, the and next- I thank, you to, oh, thank you to Richard for having done it. Thank you to Richard for having done it the last couple of years um, because I've had some insight into how much work lies ahead. Thank you. I think uh, the last year, and not, maybe not the last year, but the year before that was definitely a challenging one indeed. Um, so the next item on the agenda is appointing a liaison to the ITF nominations committee. Uh, this one is slightly different in that it, it is a standard resolution um, rather than a board effect poll. Um, so First, uh, the expression of interest prior to that was, uh, uh, prior to this meeting was from Brian Haberman. Brian, are you still willing to serve? I am. Is there anybody uh, else who, who wants to uh, throw their hat in the ring at this moment? Okay, uh, the resolution reads, uh, resolved that the ISAC board appoints Brian Haberman as ISAC board liaison to the ITF nominations committee for the 2021-2022 term. May I ask for um, uh, someone to move the motion and a second. I saw Robert move and Laura second. Uh, I suggest we do this by acclamation. Thank you very much, Brian, for your willingness to serve. Uh, the next item uh, on the agenda is the annual appointment of committee chairs and members. Um, the list that you see on the agenda was drawn from the uh, discussions that occurred after the, the first expressions of interest. Uh, there were some changes to the original um, uh, spreadsheet in order to accommodate some of the restrictions on uh, different uh, aspects of which committees uh, uh, can have overlapping uh, membership. Um, we can do this in two ways. We can either do this committee by committee or we can approve the whole. Uh, as uh, Gonzalo has pointed out a number of times, it is somewhat faster to approve the whole, but we can definitely approve it uh, committee by committee if there are specific changes people would like um, or uh, if uh, discussion needs to occur on some committees. So the first question is, uh, would the board like to uh, approve this by um, by approving the whole slate, is that that's the current proposal? Is there any objection to approving it in that way? No, I would be fine with that. Okay, uh, hearing no objection, we'll take that way forward. Uh, so, in essence, uh, the motion I would like to hear is that we move for the appointment of the. Um, uh, committee chairs and members as listed in the agenda. Can I ask somebody to move that? Um, so, sure. Sure. I, I saw George first uh, and then Brian. Uh, so George moves and Brian second. Um, uh, all in favor, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Uh, great. Uh, so we have uh, this by uh, unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder to those who are uh, watching the 
uh, the recording of this or who are uh, observers, there are a couple of committees in here, for example, the elections committee and the nominations committee, uh, for whom additional members will be uh, appointed later in the year. Um, but the committee chairs at this point um, have been appointed and they will uh, run the process from, from this point on. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the previous board minute meeting. Uh, the proposed resolution there is resolved that the minutes of the 158th meeting of the ISAC Board of Trustees held by video conference on 8th of July 2021 are approved. Are there any proposed changes to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, um, may I ask for somebody to move the motion? I'll move it. Uh, I saw Brian first and then Richard. Uh, uh, in chat, uh, Richard suggests that we use um, the raising of hands as being slightly more effective than uh, I or nay. Uh, as a result for this one, uh, I would like everybody who is in favor to please raise their hand. Ted, you'll want a verbal confirmation from Mohammed. Yes, I, I can tell I can't can't see Mohammed on my screen. Yeah. Um, Mohammed, are you in favor? Okay, let's move on to the second question. Um, is there uh, anybody who is opposed? Please raise your hand. Is there anybody who chooses to abstain? Uh, seeing no hands there. Uh, Muhammad, do you wish to record a position on this? Uh, sorry, Ted, I, uh, sorry, Chair, I lost your voice. Could you please? Uh, this is the motion uh, to approve the minutes of the previous meeting and uh, the positions available. Your uh, to, to approve the minutes of the previous meeting, and you can vote uh, yes to approve, no yes, to... Yes, I, I vote, I vote yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next item of business is uh, to welcome a new chapter. Um, uh, that resolution is resolved that the ISOC Board of Trustees warmly welcomes the Internet Society Zambia chapter, and we extend our congratulations to President Levy Sienseki and all the officers of the new chapter. Um, I propose we do this by acclamation. Uh, in that same vein, we have been notified of a, a couple of chapters, uh, the Barbados chapter and the US Colorado chapter, which have entered rejuvenation status. Um, there are, uh, at the moment, uh, several other chapters, including Nepal, South Africa, Gauteng, and Thailand in that status. And uh, certainly, I'm sure the board joins me in wishing uh, the two chapters entering and the, those chapters already in rejuvenation status uh, a success with that effort. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, to accept a summary of the agreed board action items from the 2021 Board of Trustees. So as folks will re recall, especially those who were on the previous board, um, the board will create a summary of action items that they wish the new board to consider. Um, this is um, the moment in the agenda when we acknowledge receipt of that, uh, that doesn't bind this board to, to act within it, but it is uh, a formal notification that we have received that advice from the previous board. For those of you, um, this is the act to their sin. Um, and uh, we're, we'll basically uh, go forward with this. The, the summary of the agreed board action items were continue developing a high level strategy for revenue diversification for the future of the Internet Society and the Internet Society Foundation, and continue to support the project approved as part of the Internet Society's 2021 action plan. 
Uh, the proposed resolution is accept the summary of agreed board action items from the 2021 Board of Trustees. Uh, resolve the ISAC Board of Trustees accepts the summary of agreed board action items as conveyed by the 2020 to 2021 Board of Trustees. Uh, is there any discussion? Sorry, uh, a question. Uh, I, in, I've been on several boards in the past, and this has never been uh, uh, discussed. I've never seen a motion like this. Uh, it's it's always been assumed that the new board will uh, will learn from what the old board has done and then proceed with the program. Is this a legal requirement on us? Is it just something we have done over the years? I'm not sure you can answer this immediately, but it's but it is curious that we're doing it. Thank you. Uh, I can answer it because I was uh, also curious and dug into the history a little bit. And it turns out that this is not a legal requirement per se. It's something that started. Um, uh, during uh, the previous uh, CEO's term as um, there were a couple of occasions when there was a very large turnover uh, of trustees. As you know, given the way our, our system works, we're always expecting a fair number of trustees uh, uh, to be up for re-election each time. And in cases where there's also been um, a loss of a trustee during the course of a year, that number can get quite high if there's a, um, a, a large turnover in who is uh, elected or appointed. And as a result of that, um, the CEO suggested, um, and the board at that time agreed, uh, that it was a good practice to formally hand over this advice so that even if there were a very large turnover uh, in trustees, it was then obvious to the new trustees what the consensus of the previous board had been. Uh, and it has been carried forward uh, since Kathy's time until now. Uh, it does seem to me a good practice, given the way the board appointments and elections work here, uh, to make sure that there is sort of a, a formal send and receive here. Um, and, and that's the, the history of it. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, seeing no other discussion, I will ask for a motion uh, to accept the summary. I saw Maimuna and Richard. Um, so, uh, once again, we'll do this by raising hands. All those in favor, please raise your hands now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mohammed, we have seen your hand. Um, any opposed, please raise your hand now. Any abstain? Uh, thank you very much. The motion carries unanimously. So uh, the next item on our uh, agenda is the recognition of outgoing trustees um, to express appreciation to the outgoing trustees for service to the board. There is a formal um, resolution which states resolved that the board thanks Walid. Al-Sakaf, Gonzalo Camarillo, John Levine, and Heather West for their dedication and outstanding service to the Internet Society's member of the Board of Trustees and extends special appreciation to Gonzalo for his leadership over the past five years as board chair and to John for his commitment as board secretary over the same period. Um, I, I would like to add personally, I, I have found working with uh, each of those uh, former trustees an extraordinarily enriching experience and uh, uh, the statement of this that we thank them for their dedication is not empty in any way, shape, or form. Each of them has put in an enormous amount of time and effort uh, to their service to the board, especially uh, John as secretary and Gonzalo as chair. Um, and I extend my own personal and heartfelt thank you uh, in addition to this resolution. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to this point? Me, Luis. Luis, please. Yes, I would like to thank uh, Gonzalo for his guidance on the incoming uh, board members. It has been really helpful, the, the way to understand, his way to explain and uh, for us to understand how the board works and wish the best for, uh, for John and, and Gonzalo in the future. And thanks for their service in the board. I would agree with that. And, um, you know, I think some of the things that uh, Waleed put in his note 
um, I think we all feel. I mean, uh, everybody's contributed enormously. And even when there were differences of opinion, everybody was, and it still is, uh, including the current board members, uh, enormously uh, of goodwill uh, and working together and working through um, what had been some difficult issues, um, but we all got there. Um, and I just want to, again, personally thank uh, Gonzalo and John for all of your efforts and Gonzalo uh, and his, you know, uh, incredible uh, leadership and inclusion. Uh, and, you know, Ted, you know, you're the same way. Um, so looking forward to it, but thanking everybody. Is there anybody else who would like to comment on this point? Okay, I think we should approve this by acclamation. So uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, that brings us to the end of the current uh, section of the agenda. Um, and uh, we will have a short break until uh, 1505 uh, UTC. That is uh, in approximately 15 minutes when we will resume in closed executive session to receive the PIR report. Um, so unless there is any other business for this section of the agenda, uh, we will take that short break. Any other business? Uh, just, uh, I, I just want to confirm we are resuming uh, in closed session, or immediately in closed session. Is that correct? That is correct. We will, right. we will resume immediately in closed session in order to receive the PRA report. Very good. At, 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 at 15.05. At, uh, yes, at five minutes after the hour. Right. I'm assuming that it's, the guests are not invited. Uh, for the closed session, uh, no, that, that will be a closed session because the, the yeah, I, report. I, I, Bye. See you later. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, see everybody in a few minutes. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us for this uh, session of the annual general uh, meeting of the ISAC Board of Trustees. This is meeting number 159. Uh, the purpose of this section is to hear a series of reports from different uh, community groups. And the first of those is from Miria Copeland. Before we start, is there anybody who needs to declare a conflict of interest in relation to any of these reports? Hearing none, uh, Miria. Yeah, there should be some slides somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is the report from the Internet Architecture um, Board. Um, if you just can go to the next slide immediately, oh yeah, maybe full screen would be helpful. There we are. Um, because there are some new people here, um, I had quickly have the slide just to explain what the Internet Architecture Board is. So there are three leadership groups um, in the ITF. One is the Internet Architecture Board, the other one is the IESG and the LLC Board. The IESG is um, more responsible for, let's say, operations of the working groups and the and the and the and the RCs and the meetings. Um, the LSC is uh, more on the administrative and financial side, and the um, IEB has another set of tasks which is listed on the slide. Um, so we are responsible for a bunch of uh, process related things like electing and, and appointing people to certain positions. Um, also having the whole external liaison process is something that we manage. Uh, we are the contact point for IENA, we are the contact point for ISOC as well. Um, and there's also this A in the IEB, the architecture part, where uh, we are a body that has like architecture oversight over what, what the um, IETF is doing. And that means we um, try to figure out if there are any kind of gaps missing, if there are any kind of um, rec high, high level recommendation that might be useful to the community. And we do this by organizing the workshops, uh, organizing ourselves into programs, also writing a couple of RSCs from time to time. Okay, um, on the next slide, you um, see the current IAB members. So the IAB has 12 community selected members. Um, and on top of that, we have also the IETF chair as a member of the IAB. We have the IRTF chair in the IAB and we have the RFC edit, um, series editor, or actually at the moment, it's the RFC project manager. It's a, it's a temporary position here. So that's us. Next slide. 
Um, I think you already received um, the report that we produce uh, with all the details of uh, what we do that we produce for every ITF meeting, but uh, here's also the link again. I just want to highlight um, two things. We, um, between the last meeting and this meeting, we created a new position, which is called the Liaison Cornelia position, um, which is currently served by Tommy Pauli and Wes Hardecker. Um, and this is mainly for our internal organization, how we want to handle um, liaison management in the IETF. However, if you ever have any questions about liaison, so liaison management, um, what I actually want to point you to is this email address. We have the new email address, which is liaison, uh, liaison minus coordination at IAB.org. So if you have any questions, feel free to send something there. And the other point I want to highlight quickly is that we recently published RFC 9075, which is a report um, of the workshop that we had last November on um, network impacts based on the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, I, I reported a little bit on this workshop already uh, the last time I was here, I guess, so that's why I wanted to just provide you this link if you want to read the full report there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Another thing uh, I would like to quickly mention to you is also um, related to this architecture oversight part. So what we did recently is also trying to focus more on the technical and architectural work. And one of the things that we've been doing is that we try to reserve one of our calls, our usually weekly calls that we have uh, once per month, one of these calls for technical discussions only. And um, you can see that we did this for a couple of weeks already, and you can see some of the topics we've been discussing. Um, we, the, our last discussion was on content moderation, and we had two people from ISOC um, coming in, giving us some background information about um, legal aspects uh, and these kind of things. So that was very good and very interesting for us, and I hope we can do that more often, um, because I think that's very valuable. So in general, if you are interested in any of these calls, um, the IB calls are actually open for observers. Um, so you can find the agenda on the IB webpage and also find the minutes of these calls uh, in case this is something interesting for you. Um, yeah, on the next slide, I also want to highlight to you our uh, upcoming next workshop that we're organizing. So we are organizing a workshop on measuring network quality of, for end users. Um, the workshop will be in September. Uh, the submission deadline is uh, in two days on Monday. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can actually uh, submit a position paper to us that just has to be a very short paper um, explaining your interest in this topic. Uh, and we would be able to invite you to the workshop, but we can also figure out if you're really interested to invite you uh, without a paper that's uh, uh, more convenient for you. So anyway, this is coming up just for your information. And then I have one last slide. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this is interesting for any of you, um, but we are in the in the middle of uh, a quite big um, redesigning effort regarding the RFC editor model. Was there a question? I'm not sure. Let me run through the slide and then we can have questions anyway. Um, so the ITF in the middle of uh, redesigning the RFC editor model. Um, so that is organized by an IB program, but it's really a community driven process. Um, and the reason why I'm highlighting this here right now is because we made quite good progress recently. So there's now a document describing the basis of this new model. Um, and so if you're interested in this, then you, um, this is the right point of time to look at this draft and, and, and read what's, what's going on there. So um, the, the major change is um, from the previous model where there was mainly the RFC editor and then also the RFC editor who is like um, responsible also for strategy uh, and oversight. And then on the other side, there was the RFC production center, which does all the operational stuff. We now basically have two additional entities. One is the, the RFC series working group. So this is more organized like a working group um, to get more input to the, from the community and more transparency. And that group is now responsible for strategic questions. That group is then supposed to also publish RFCs about the operation of the RFC series. And, um, and these um, documents are then approved by the RFC series approval board, which is also a new entity we are creating. And this board consists of the stream managers and the RFC editor. So basically what we have here is that the role of the RFC editor is changing from um, you know, being the one and only deciding about strategy more to an advisory role to the working group and to the board and to the production center. And that's already my report. So if you have any questions, let me know.
Uh, thanks uh, very much for the report, Mary. Are there any questions? It's me, Luis. Luis, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Myra, for the uh, for your presentation. Uh, I just read uh, somewhere in the, in the report that there was an open meeting last 29th of July. So do you, uh, I know it has been so, such a short time between now and the 29th of July, but do you have any insights about what, uh, what are the, uh, the results of the, that open meeting? So um, this is a, a, also a thing that we do for roughly a year right now that we have at every ITF meeting, we also have this IAB open meeting. Um, so that gives us more time with the community to discuss about technical aspects and we do a little bit of reporting to the community about our programs, our workshops, and also the documents we're working on, or the technical documents, not the administrative boring stuff. Um, so uh, this time we reported back um, mainly on the EDM program. That's also something that I did report to you a while ago, but you can also find it on the um, IAB page uh, and also uh, some technical drafts we're working on right now. Um, I don't think I have anything like there's no like big outcome out, out of that. <laughs> it's more like explaining these things to the community and getting input from the community what we do there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions for Maria? Hey, Maria, um, I, I just wanted to ask, I saw on one of the other slides, something that I've seen on slides for years about the, the IB um, acting in some kind of advisory capacity to the Internet Society. Like, how do you see that relationship these days? It's been a while since I was on the IB. Can you, can you just kind of fill us in on that? Yeah, actually, this is also something that we did discuss recently. Um, Andrew came to us and, and did us a little bit of an update about the, the plans and strategy, strategy from ISOC. So we're a little bit more up to date there. Uh, um, I really uh, think we should try to, you know, make the best out of that um, in, in the sense that we try to keep both sides up to date about what we're doing and then um, utilizing the cap capabilities we have there. And one of the things we did recently is, for example, um, in invited some people from ISOC about this content moderation that was very valuable for us. Uh, and I also discussed with Karen um, that we should like figure out those things more often on both sides and just like have a, have a good communication and, and, and utilize the expertise we have on both sides. So I hope that we can can work, not work, work closely together, but having a better overview about what the other organization is doing so we can, can uh, have a discussion when it's needed or when it's useful. Thank you. Thank you. Any any more comments or questions? Andrew? Uh, yeah, this is really for the benefit of the trustees. Um, uh, but you mentioned Karen in passing there, and it, and all the trustees may not know who you're referring to. So Karen O'Donoghue is part of our staff, and she is the liaison from the staff to the IAB. Uh, formally, remember that uh, the IAB is actually an advisory committee to the board, to, to all of you. Um, so the, the formal relationship uh, is, is very much like the, um, the, the Chapter 8 Advisory Council and the OMAC, uh, but, uh, but we have a staff function um, that, that provides that link. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we get regular uh, feedback from her. I don't know if it would be useful to the board to, um, to have a regular check-in with her, but if that's, uh, if that's something you would like, I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Andrew. Let's take that to maybe one of the working board sessions as a question. Any other comments from Maria? Okay, thank you again, Maria, for, for the report today and for the, the uh, sending it in early so that the uh, trustees could read it in advance. I see Jason has joined us as well, and I believe he is next. Yep, thank you. I will be off again. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Hi, Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how are you? Uh, good, right. we have a couple of new trustees uh, uh, yep. who have joined us since uh, you were last year. Uh, and that's uh, Brian and Brian Haberman and John Peterson, who I think you know. Uh, Luis, do you want to give a quick introduction to Jason? Hi, Jason, uh, my name is Luis Martinez. 
Uh, I was selected by chapters and um, I'm a professor at the Iberoamericana University in Mexico City. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, Mohamed. Hi, this is Mohamed Shabir. I'm from Pakistan and I work at National Defense University, Islamabad there, and I represent chapters on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, Jason, do you want to give a quick introduction and then your report? Sure, of course. Yeah, nice to uh, meet the new folks. Um, my name is Jason Livingood. I am chair of the IETF's uh, LLC board, so sort of the administrative and legal uh, oversight um, organization for the IETF. And I previously served on the Internet Society board, so I'm very familiar with the work that you're all doing. Um, and I'm based uh, on the, in the United States on the East Coast. Uh, Kevin, do you want me to uh, do the slides? Or, oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is really just give a summary of the report that um, we just presented at the past ITF meeting, which was another um, online meeting uh, just concluded um, yesterday, in fact. Um, Kevin, if you can do the next slide. Our main sponsor was Juniper, so we thank them in the plenary and appreciate their financial support. They're one of our key um, global supporters. Next one. Um, and I won't go through all these. These are kind of pro forma. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. <laughs> uh, so our next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Madrid in November of this year. And uh, we have a meeting with the uh, IESG, the Internet Engineering Steering Group next week to make a decision on whether or not to proceed um, with an in-person meeting or a hybrid meeting or to have an online meeting again. And while a final decision hasn't been made, I think we can all, um, I think we all assume based on the Delta variant right now that it's unlikely that we'll be able to meet in person in Madrid. And so um, if you go to the next slide, uh, one more. So looking ahead, you know, the ITF, um, for those that aren't familiar with it, has met three times a year in person um, all around the world. And it rotates between North America uh, or the Americas, um, Europe and Asia and, um, you know, so this one was supposed to be in San Francisco, but it was held online, of course, which is what we've done since um, the pandemic began. Um, the Madrid meeting uh, looks unlikely to be possible to hold in person, but like I said, we'll decide soon. And what we typically do is we rebook those um, those venues for the future because there was you know a lot of work typically done to research those locations and to secure contracts and so on. And then the March. Um, one of, of next year will be potentially in Bangkok and then Philadelphia uh, next July. And I think at this point, this is sort of the biggest challenge facing the organization is determining, of course, you know, when is it possible to begin in-person meetings and what does that first in-person meeting look like? It's very likely some sort of a hybrid meeting where you have a substantial number of people participating online while you have some people in person. And so the, the in particular, um, our volunteer teams like our tools and um, knock teams are spending a lot of time beginning to think about what that looks like from a technology standpoint and um, how to manage that so that everyone everyone's participation is more or less on equal footing. So we'll see, you know, this is the biggest uncertainty. We're of course not alone in facing this. So um, we'll see, see what happens and our fingers are crossed for, uh, you know, uh, good developments in the future. Next slide. Um, we actually had some very good uh, attendance numbers, um, uh, 1,200 people uh, for this meeting, which was above budget. It was great to see. Next slide. And uh, we've got actually two new hires um, on the staff. Um, Lee Berkeley, who is our new director of the development, so the person hired to be in charge of fundraising and uh, Kisara, who is a software development engineer. We have a huge amount of technical debt on our different uh, platforms. And so Kisara is one of the folks that's uh, taking that on along with Robert Sparks and other folks. Next slide. Next one. 
And these are our board members. Um, next slide. So we publish all of our meetings in advance. The one thing that's notable here, um, which I'll mention um, again on the next slide, but I'll just go into detail here, is typically we have a monthly board meeting, um, but in August we actually have an additional meeting, which is our second IASA 2 webinar. And so for folks that aren't familiar with what that is, it's the, um, it's basically the, the administrative model or architecture, if you will, for how the ITF is run and organized and, and overseen. And the version that created the LLC board a few years ago was called IASA 2 because it was the second iteration of that model. And when they, that um, organization was established in our sort of formative documents, we committed to doing a three-year retrospective to basically go back and review were we able to achieve all the objectives that were set forth when the organization was envisioned, are there any open issues, et cetera. And so that consultation is ongoing with the community and we established a variety of ways that we can take feedback from email to GitHub, to webinars, office hours, et cetera. So that's one of those things. Next slide. Uh, so since our last meeting um, in March, uh, our last IETF meeting, these are the main things that have been taking place. We completed our second um, financial review and audit, uh, got a clean bill of health, the fiscal 2020, that's great. As I mentioned, we're um, in the three-year retrospective right now. We updated our um, SWAT pest assessment, which uh, Peter Van Rusra uh, helped facilitate. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, political, economic, social, technical. So basically looking at the context within which the organization fits and potential risks and how to mitigate those things. And then a very minor thing, um, just finishing an email policy for staff accounts now that we have some new um, staffers coming on board. Next slide. So in terms of budget, um, we are doing uh, fairly well. The revenue uh, difference here, the reason for that is simply down to when we recognized the, um, the revenue from ISOC, in fact. Um, so sort of the timing of when that came and you know when our budget was set. So you know that that's not something I would really pay attention to. Um, in terms of where we stand and where we're projecting to be towards end of year, in terms of uh, net income, you know it'll be pretty close to a wash. In our budget, we we envision that we would have, you know, probably two in-person meetings. Doesn't seem likely to be the case. Um, so a lot of our costs and revenues end up going down, but we've figured out a, an equilibrium, a way to sort of match those on a meeting by meeting basis, um, which is good. And that's partly because we have a, a registration fee for those online meetings. Next slide. And we've got lots of ways for people to contact us. And next one, I think is the last. Yep, that's it. So that's it for the slides. Happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jason. Are there any questions for him? Uh, Brent? Um, the three-year retrospective, you, you mentioned having a, a bunch of different ways for people to communicate back the feedback. What, what's been the feedback rate like? Feedback rate is uh, very, very, very low at the moment. Uh, so we are planning to send some reminders um, via email in the next uh, couple of weeks, just to try to drum up a little bit more um, feedback. I think part of that is certainly, you know, it's vacation time for many people. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, we wanna try to elicit a little bit more feedback. And we posed in particular, I can't remember the exact number of discussion items. It might have been like three or four or five discussion items where we really wanted specific feedback from the community. And um, those are the ones in particular that we'll be pushing hard again. Cool, thanks. So Jason. George, yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, George. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jason, just to verify, your uh, fiscal year is January through December? That's right, yeah. And, and uh, I noticed in your uh, uh, statement, the last slide, that you have about $20 million in reserve, right? Are they acted? Is that, essentially, is that essentially your reserve uh, uh, portfolio and your investments? Yeah, it's reserves and endowment and things like that. But yeah, we want to make sure we, we've maintained, and I think it was in the formation documents, um, I think it was like three years of reserves to be able to continue operation if there was some major interruption. We don't foresee anything in the 
you know, in the near to medium term. That's prudent. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Jason, um, live meetings, you have a pretty good idea of how to balance the cost. And obviously when you go um, pure online, um, it's easy to equilibrium. Um, when we get back to hybrids, most hotels have minimums and minimum attendances and the rest of those. Do you have some kind of like plan or slush for how to finesse that depending on unexpected attendance, either good or bad? Yeah, so the one thing, so Jay, um, who's our executive director, JDLA, has been working yep. with AMS, the secretariat on this. And, you know, I guess the good thing is the hospitality industry is very flexible right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's a positive. Um, but it, it has been apparent in some of the conversations that they're very willing to um, let us reduce the meeting footprint size. Um, as needed, and um, you know that will help so that we don't have you know way you know huge amounts of excess space. So there there seems like there's a great deal of flexibility, and in particular, um, it seems easy to be able to take an agreement if we wanted to and move that off into the future and come up with a smaller one. But I think the big big question will be for the next one, like maybe the first hybrid meeting, is is it going to be let's say one location with let's say half of the people and the other half sort of distributed online, or would there be a notion of like regional centers around the world that people might go to? I don't think anybody has a really great answer to that. Um, the community is doing a lot of thinking about that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think the other thing that we've got to figure out is what does the fee structure potentially look like? Because when we have had in-person meetings, entirely in-person, it was free for the remote participants, but when we've gone entirely online, there has been a fee. And so we're, we're going to begin some sort of a fee consultation with the community to figure out you know, when you have a mix and you still have some costs to defray and it's not all met by the in-person attendance, you know, what does that look like? Um, and when we last did that sort of consultation for online meetings, it was like right before it happened because of how fast COVID came out. So we're hoping to have a lot more time and involve more community comment, but we'll see. There's a lot of open questions. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, quick. Just a comment on that is that, um, yeah, most people are still figuring out corporate um, travel budgets and kind of conference budgets in advance too. So yeah, I, yeah. The, the sooner that we can make some kind of stab at what we're going to do, I suspect that's probably good to share. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, it's the other sort of complicating factor here, because uh, as an example, we were speaking with um, some of the folks from our sponsor for the Madrid meeting, and they said, even if you held the meeting here, like, we're not allowed to travel, and we don't have travel budget. So, um, you know, it, it will be certainly complicated. A quick follow up to, to, to that. I, I know that in the first couple of times, uh, there were there were fee waivers offered for people who couldn't afford the remote. Uh, those were sponsored. Uh, are those, do you continue to find sponsors for that? Yeah, it's continued to work as it has in the past and we get a good number and it doesn't seem like the worries of being overrun with fee waiver requests has, has occurred. So people are being really reasonable about it. Um, so we've been pleased it's, it's worked really well. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Jason? Uh, Luis. Yes. Have you considered the possibility that if you go back to, or we go back to online or face-to-face -face, uh, sessions, and then because of the advancement of the pandemic around the world, the uh, the, the, the next place uh, cannot be held in person? Uh, would it change a lot the, the plans to go back and forth from uh, online to presential? That's a good good question. Um, I don't think so. I think we are at this point so used to all the uncertainty here and uh, able to <laughs> sort of, you know, quickly pivot to make changes in the, in the meeting plans that I think will be okay. And we know how to do online and we know how to do in person and we'll learn soon how to do a hybrid meeting. So I think once those three things are um, you know, might be a rotation, you know, depending upon what part of the world and where the, the virus is. Um, so we'll see, but I think, I think we'll be okay with that. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jason, for, for the report and for the conversation after it. Uh, we look forward sure. to continuing to working with you. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Take care. Glenn, uh, welcome. Uh, 
you, you are up next just to give a quick introduction. I, I think you know uh, John Peterson and uh, Brian Haberman from, from the ITF, but uh, Mohammed, would you like to introduce yourself to Glenn? Uh, yes, Mohammed Shabir Awan from Pakistan. Hello, Mohammed. Hi, my name is Luis Martinez. I'm a professor at Iberoamericana University in Mexico City. Nice to meet you. Hello, Luis. Nice and to meet and you. Glenn, if you could go ahead with the, uh, your introduction and report. Sure. Um, so I'm Glenn Dean. I work for Comcast NBC Universal in my day job and in my off time. I'm the chair of the ITF Trust. And if um, uh, I can get my slides put up. Kevin, you got those slides? So, you know, it's interesting, as Ted says, I recognize a few of the faces. I also recognize a few of the faces have either been ITF trustees or are current ITF trustees, uh, such as John. So uh, some of this will be um, material some of you have heard before, and some of this is material some of you helped put together at some point in your, in your relationship with the ITF Trust. Uh, but next slide, please. So currently there are five trustees. Uh, when the ITF uh, uh, spun off and created the ITF LLC that Jason just talked about, uh, one of the things we had to change was that in the past, the old committee, the, the IAOC, which oversaw the administrative portions of the IETF, uh, one of the things that that role got you if you were on the IOC was that you became eligible to become an IETF trustee. And when we spun off the LLC and created that whole thing and, and blew up the IOC and ended it, we had to create a new process for selecting trustees. And we had to figure out what does a trustee need to be. Uh, so far that involved changing, you know, uh, the, the definition of membership authorities or ability for ITF trustees so that they no longer had to be an IOC member since the IOC no longer existed. Uh, but also part of it involved, well, you know, who selects trustees and where they come from. So how it's done today is uh, we get three selected by the ITF NOMCOM. We have one selected by the ITF's IESG and we have one selected by yourselves. And so that brings us together with five people. Uh, I'm the chair, Kathleen Moriarty is the treasurer. Joel Halper and John Levine and Stefan are uh, the, round out the other uh, five trustees all together. And together, what our mission is, is to manage IP for the ITF and the broader community on the internet. Next slide, please. So as I said, we manage IP. What does that mean? Well, it really means that uh, if there's copyrights that needed to be managed or protected, that's a thing we will do. And we uh, do that for the ITF. Uh, if there are uh, copyrights for other materials or copyright related discussions that need to take place, we also do that. So for instance, uh, the protocol uh, parameter registers that are registries that are up on IANA uh, are something that the ITF trust uh, provides uh, sort of IP oversight over for the materials that come into that. Uh, primarily from the ITF, but they can come into it from other places. Uh, but we, we look at that and ask, the, you know, how is that being managed? Is it being managed with the intent of the community? And part of the intent of the community for IP around here is not to lock it up and make it inaccessible, but in fact, to make it accessible, make it easy for the broad internet to make use of, but also at the same time protect. Because if we just uh, let some of these things said, we don't care, they're free, do whatever you want, uh, we could get into situations where somebody might uh, take something that we've created as a community, extend it, and then lock it away from us as a community to prevent us from even using it. So we, we defend the IP uh, while keeping the, the sort of general principle, let's make this easy to use and accessible. And so we navigate the legal structures of IP and that's copyrights, trademarks, uh, but not patents uh, around the world, and we protect it on the behalf of the community. We also do this, as I say, for IANA, we also do it for ICANN. Uh, so uh, if the ICANN IT department, for instance, wants to make changes to the uh, domains for ICANN, uh, one of the things that the trust does is we actually provide a uh, checkpoint where they have to go and say, we wanna make the following change. The trustees themselves actually are in the role of approving those changes. And so we provide a sort of a, a checkpoint to make sure that, uh, you know, unwanted changes are getting made. So does that make sense? We also do some software stuff, IETF tools. 
uh, the ITF Yang catalog. And recently we've uh, entered into an agreement with the ITF LLC. When they got spun up and created, they started creating IP as a legal entity. And the question came up, well, who owns and manages that IP? Well, the, uh, the LLC does a lot of things. You know, they manage big budgets, they work on the meetings, uh, they, they work on fundraising for the ITF. Uh, we said, well, the trust does that for everybody else. Why don't we do that for the ITF LLC? And so we just recently entered an agreement where the LLC transferred the IP it had been created, things like badges for quick and other things, transferred over the trust for our management. And then we sublicense it back to them and say, hey, this is yours. We'll protect it, but you go off and use it however you like. And you can even sublicense it to other people. And if you have problems, you need somebody to send nasty letters and you know, somebody's doing something bad, come back to us. We're there for you to do that for you and help you protect your IP. Next slide, please. So this will come up uh, in, in a couple slides why I'm explaining our trust structure. Uh, we are currently a Virginia Commonwealth Trust and uh, we're independent of the ITF, we're independent of ISOC. Uh, that is for historic reasons. Uh, when we were originally spun up, uh, there was a desire by members of the community uh, who owned a lot of IP themselves to figure out where, where's a nice neutral place to house and protect this IP. And so they spun up the ITF trust. If you spun it up today, you may not have called it the ITF trust. You might simply have called it like, you know, the big internet IP uh, protector for the internet community. I don't know, something else. Because sometimes just called the IETF trust gets a little confusing. It makes people think we just do ITF stuff. We don't just do ITF stuff, we do more. Uh, and you can see there we have a website, trustee.itf.org. Uh, I, I covered there's five trustees. Uh, the trustees themselves are not lawyers typically. They don't have to be lawyers. If you are a lawyer, you can still be a trustee. We don't hold that against you. Uh, but the role of the trustees is instead of just handing this over to a, a law firm or a legal group, the, uh, you know, if you did that, you might end up with capture from one particular legal viewpoint. They may not represent the community. So by having five trustees that sort of guide this and listen to the community, engage with the community, and then represent the community's uh, interests, uh, and with dialogue with the community when we want to make changes, uh, we provide that sort of community balance, just like the, you know, yourselves provide that balance for ISOC. And the LLC board provides that for the uh, ITF LLC and the ITF community. We're small. We have a small budget. It's around $100,000. Uh, most of that we actually spend on support, lawyers, and things like registrations. We have services that will monitor domains to see if they change. Uh, but we're very small and we try to have a diversity of funding. We get a lot of our funding from the IETF. In the past, it was from ISOC, uh, but we also get contributions in the past from Google, NBC, Tencent have contributed. Uh, and we continue to look for places where it makes sense for us to do outreach uh, and seek small contributions. We do not want to be, build a big war chest. That's not ours. We just want enough really to cover our operating costs and have a little bit of reserve in the bank in case something goes bump in the night. Next slide, please. So what have we been doing? Well, I mentioned the ITF LLC IPA R transfer. So we took over uh, some stuff from them and then licensed it back. Uh, we've been working uh, on the IANA parameters registry. It turns out that while the stuff there is intended to be easily accessible without uh, additional controls, in fact, much of it isn't subject to copyright because of the way copyright laws uh, shake out. Uh, it's confusing and we've had questions come in from adopters and users of that stuff wanting clarification. So we did a consultation with the ITF and said, you know, we want to officially declare this stuff to be much more open. And here's how we're going to go about doing it. The ITF looked at and said, sounds great. Uh, we continue to work with ICANN to get the right balance. We're working with ICANN and IANA, uh, the, the legal staff over there to make sure the way we do this uh, expresses the intent correctly and doesn't uh, start infringing upon anybody else's stuff like IEEE's that are also in the I IANA registry. So it's a little bit complicated. We're getting there. It's a slow process. Sometimes it can get extra slow when you deal with lawyers, but that's life. <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, we also protect, uh, you know, in addition, copyrights, logos, trademarks. So like the ITF logo, uh, we are a fashion consulting place. We get to approve ITF t-shirts. And the primary purpose there is that we don't want people taking the ITF artwork and the logo and creating something brand new <laughs> that is a hybrid that they might be a derivative work that they might own part of. And so we take a look at the shirts and make sure that the shirts themselves are you know, conforming to the usage rules around those logos and those marks. Next slide, please. We're almost done. 
So what's going on in 2021? Um, well, one of the big things we're talking about is, do we need to restructure the trust from uh, the current uh, registration in Virginia to something else? It wouldn't necessarily be an LLC. I put that on here sort of to let people understand where we're thinking the direction would be. Um, the idea here is that when this was created, it, it made sense to a lot of people uh, that it become a trust the way it was registered. As time gone on, has gone on, that sort of has not become the best practice in the legal community. And one of the things that's showing up is things like when we as trustees, we, you know, we're uh, personally on, on, the, um, uh, on the list for people that could potentially be sued uh, for these marks and for these registrations and for bad actions. So we carry insurance on ourselves. Well, we have trouble now increasing that amount of insurance because we're a trust and the insurance companies look at us and go, that doesn't seem right. That just doesn't make sense that you guys would be that structure. We're not gonna write you any additional insurance. We'll give you insurance, but we're not gonna increase the amount. And so one of the things we're right up against is, well, how do we do that? Well, maybe one of the things we need to look at is restructuring ourselves legally, still do all the same functions, nothing else would change in that regard, but just how we register as a legal entity so that when we interact with these other parties, we look like they expect us to look like, and we follow sort of legal best practice as of today for how we're registered and, and, and structured. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I emphasize that because uh, sometimes people get a little freaked out when we say that, we're not trying to change the trust, we're not trying to add anybody new, and we're not trying to expand our scope. It would just be a sort of almost a clerical level legal registration change of how we're structured as a legal entity. So, um, next slide please. This is how you can reach us. You can mail us at the trustees. Uh, you can go to the website. We have stuff there to contact us. Or uh, you can talk to John Levine, who's also a trustee and he's one of you. Or you can email me. We're very friendly people. And with that, any questions? Thanks very much, Glenn. Any questions or comments for Glenn? At least one. Somebody has to say something. <laughs> Hi, Glenn. J just for clarification, if we re if we reorganize, well, reorganize as a nonprofit corporation. It turns out there's no such thing as a nonprofit LLC. But as you said, it's just paperwork and the actual operation and the actual trustees and the people we talk to and the things we do would all be the same. It would just it would, it would end up saving a fair amount of money because our insurance agent tells us that it's practically impossible to get to get the kind of insurance we need for a trust, and it's much easier for a corporation. And, and I'll add, of course, we're not going to you know go off and do this. In, you know. Friday night one time in a back alley. We're gonna do a consultation with the community and say, this is what we're planning to doing. Here's why we're doing it. Let's get your input. Let's talk about what makes sense. And then we would act. Please. Uh, so let me just let me just ask very quickly. I'm sorry, Ted, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, if you want, and Luis, if you need to talk, go ahead. Okay, mine was just a quick question. The, uh, the, there is this worry about the registration of the marks or, or the trademarks in, uh, around the world, but the, uh, the, there is some protection from WIPO, right? Well, of course we follow, um, we, we become subject to WIPO and also the, uh, the Burns Convention for copyright. So all the, those things we do follow and, and we are uh, protected by. Uh, but you have to execute within the framework of those legal structures. So for instance, trademarks, well, one thing you have to do is you have to register it. <laughs> and then the next thing you have to do is, of course, protect it. And protection is, is where we actually you know, observe if we discover somebody, say, for instance, using the ITF logo on a product. Let's say somebody decided to make a router and they, they said, oh, this is an officially ITF branded router product. Well, that's an example where we go have a conversation and say, you can't do that. <laughs> Like that's not allowed, and please stop doing that. And so, uh, and, and we'll see where if we had to go to you know court, we would of course do that if we needed to. But usually, these things resolve themselves with letters and lawyers yelling at each other a little bit. There has been a lot of cases in the past, or just one of. Uh, well, I, I've only been around for about five years, and fortunately, during that five-year time, we have not been sued, <laughs> and we haven't. <laughs> we haven't had to pursue anybody um, aggressively. We do get requests like, you know, for instance, I would like to use these materials in the following way. Uh, we do get those requests, you know, periodically throughout the year. We, the trustees will take a look at them and we will evaluate them. If they make sense and they're within the community's intent and they don't weaken our, our, our protections, we will say, sure, go ahead. Uh, and a, a really good example of that is if, you know, according to the, the current rules the ITF puts out and the trust manages, 
for use of an RFC, for instance. If you use the entire RFC without modification, without cutting it up and without taking snippets out, just show the RFC as it is. You don't need to talk to us. You can just go ahead and do that. We've already pre-approved that. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, you wanted to take a few lines out of the RFC and put it in your book and then you know do something else and take a few other lines and then maybe add some of your own special sauce around that RFC and how it's said to do things, and said, well, this is still really the RFC. No, no, you can't do that. We, we don't allow you to take little snippets and piecemeal them apart into new structures uh, because there were a lot of bad things would come from that. And not to, the least of which is confusion over the specification itself. If you have people that could like sort of do a hybrid specification with ours and then theirs mixed in together and people couldn't tell them apart, then that would weaken overall the, the RFC itself because then which, which one's the right RFC? It would confuse people. And so that's why we protect these things. Excellent, thank you. Mike? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, I'm glad that John asked the question about uh, LLC or, or, or did the clarification on LLCs versus nonprofit corporation because uh, I, when I was general counsel of the Wikimedia Foundation, which was a uh, you know, 501c3 nonprofit, we had a similar set of problems with our marks. We had trademarks. Uh, and uh, although uh, the uh, intellectual property of the of Wikipedia and the other Wikimedia projects was freely licensed, we had to protect the mark so that people knew when they saw the mark that the content associated with it was free. And I think you have a similar situation with regard to the RFCs where you have to invoke your trademarks to make sure that uh, uh, there's not misidentification of something as an RFC that is not an RFC. Uh, and, and that's a hard uh, balance to, uh, to strike, but, but, but we were able to do it. So, I, so I'm sorry that this has maybe turned into more of a comment than a question because actually between um, John and Luis, I have heard my questions answered, but uh, I do respect what you're doing. And I hope you find some comfort in the fact that I at least recognize <laughs> You know what 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 you're doing with a mix of uh, uh, of intellectual property protection and uh, providing resources freely to the larger community. Thanks. You know this is where I probably should. You know you bring up the, the trademark registrations, Mike. And one of the peculiarities of the law is that um, you can't register trademarks to trusts. Yeah, I know that seems and, to be a problem. So but right what? now. The people who actually own all these trademarks are actually John, myself, and the other three trustees. We are personally the owners of these marks. And I've, I've, I've joked a few times and said, don't piss us off. We'll go off and create our own ITF because we could because <laughs> we own the trademarks. <laughs> so, uh, but we won't do that. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but uh, we'll track you and keep, see if you keep your promise. Well, and that's part of the reason also, if we, if we go to a, you know, a, a different legal structure, the hope is that those trademarks get owned by that legal structure. That's, that's right. And, and not the individual. That's the right model, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So no, that's, that's, that, that, that is that and that and the insurance are the, are the two ongoing advantages that right. it'll be cheaper in the future. Right. So, and, and it, well, this is the third one, John, and that is when we get a new trustee, you, we have to currently, we hand them a document, which is here, sign your life away. Uh, and by the way, we should tell you, there's a lot of risk involved with <laughs> what you're about to sign, but don't worry, we carry a lot of insurance for you. Uh, and so when we do that new structure, the hope is that that document becomes a lot less risky for the new trustees to sign. Anyways, that's it. Any other questions? Uh, thanks very much, Glenn, for your report and for the explanation of the work of the trust. Uh, we look forward to working with you and uh, thanks again. Thanks. Hey, Ted, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. You, you seem to be running the meeting. Are you the new chair of this group? Yes. <laughs> then let me say congratulations. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
assume that everybody has uh, um, looked at that presentation and uh, doesn't need me to run through it again. I've noted that there have been a number of questions as well uh, on the mailing list. I hope that uh, you know, um, uh, things that were received there that uh, anything that I've uh, answered has been answered to people's satisfaction, but I'm happy to take any questions people have. Uh, great. Uh, so if folks who have questions, please use the raise hand tool and we'll start running a queue. Uh, Laura. Hi, Andrew. Sorry, I asked the question a bit late, which was, uh, it looks like we're doing really well on a lot of the targets in the action plan. And I was curious whether in the past we had revised those targets upward at mid-year. Um, you know, if we're doing so well, then let's let's set them a little higher while we can. Uh, so the as a general rule, I don't like to move goalposts um, once the game has started. So um, I think our our plan has been actually that we keep the targets where they are in the current year, uh, but we take this into account for um, the, uh, setting of future targets. Uh, I, I will note that historically, the Internet Society didn't always have a superb um, history of, of tracking these things um, terribly well. So um, the, 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 the practice of, you know, sort of setting explicit targets and so on is one that the staff didn't really have historically. Uh, and so we've, you know, we've had to learn a little bit that about um, uh, about setting these things correctly and so on. So, you know, I think next year's will be probably a little more accurate, uh, but I will point out that, for instance, we've also gotten better on, uh, you know, making budgets that we actually stick to. So on the whole, I think that this exercise is a good one. And that's part of the reason that I don't like to like to move the numbers around while the year is going on. That seems completely reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Thanks. So Andrew, as, as Laura pointed out, a lot of stuff is going really well. Um, stuff that's not already achieved seems to be well in progress. Um, I kind of wanted to ask the reverse question. Where do you think the biggest kind of risk points are uh, for us in the, in the remainder of the year? Uh, well, uh, I mean, one thing of course is that the uh, the, the financial numbers, particularly with respect to org members, are not all that we would hope. And uh, that's an area where, you know, we, we're still struggling a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've tried to point out to, to the staff more than once, because, you know, people are sometimes a little um, unhappy about this. The, the, the thing about particularly large corporations that, um, you know, uh, are some of the ones that we've lost, uh, is is they, they don't turn real quickly, right? So so the problem is that it took a while for some of them to leave, uh, and and then they realized, oh, actually, you know, we're not getting what we need out of the Internet Society. So it will take us time to to win those people back, and so that's one of the risks that that there's more of this softness that we haven't really fully understood. So I think that that's a big risk. There remains obviously just operational risk from the from the realities of COVID. I mean, we don't you know we don't know what else. Uh, what else could happen? Um, it feels like 2020 is still going on in some ways, and um, uh, and that it, it's a gift that keeps on giving. So I think that uh, you know that that remains a, a very serious risk. Um, and more generally, there is this enormous risk I think going on for the very you know nature, the very meaning of the Internet Society, and that is that the public discourse has turned against the internet to a large extent. I think that what we see is, is, you know, certainly when I when I first got connected to the internet, I mean, if you asked anybody at the time, you know, do you want an inter internet connection? Everybody would have been enthusiastically, yes, that's a great idea. I love the internet, it's fantastic. The, you know, just, just on Thursday, I guess it was, the Canadian government brought out this uh, plan for what they're gonna do about online, uh, online arms. And uh, their plan is basically, well, we're gonna we're gonna create a czar that's gonna like decide what you know what good speech on the internet is like. I mean, this is you know we no longer have to worry about totalitarian governments who don't like the internet because you know democratic governments that have been long in support of it have now kind of turned against it. And I think that that's a, a, a sort of existential risk for uh, you know for the internet society. I think that's the thing that really keeps me up at night. Oh. 
Yeah. Um, so I was going through the um, renewals and having gone through this with other um, nonprofits also um, of the how do you get people to renew? Um, one of the things was that there were a fair number of these failed to renewals where we simply no longer had or your renewal people had no longer anyone to talk to at those organizations. Um, do we do any form of vaguely LinkedIn like sharing of I know somebody at or does anybody on the board because I know that with investment and VCs, one of the values they bring in is who they know. Um, and so we used to get in the habit of asking the board, do you have a contact with this customer that can help us get an in? Are we doing anything like that? We do, yes. Um, but there is a, uh, a deeper problem uh, uh, hiding underneath this, which is a lot of our a lot of our organizational, sorry, we stopped using organizational. We're going to use organization. A lot of our organization members um, uh, have, we, we, we have different kinds of organization members. And some of them really are members as organizations, but a, a, a chunk of them are really, you know, kind of individual members who happen to be employed by somebody. And when the person goes, the, the interest of the organization wanes as well. And what we need to do, um, and this is, I think, what the team is working very hard on, is, is to provide more general um, value for organization members so that the organization sees uh, a, an organization reason to be involved with the Internet Society. And I, I, I think we're getting better at it. I don't think we've got all the way there yet, but I, I believe that we're, we're headed in the right direction because the, the team has started thinking in those terms and we've, got, we've had some uh, changes in the staff that have uh, really been addressing some of that. Yeah, value propositions um, that translate to dollars, which is really what gets them up the chain at corporations is a, is a challenge. Good to hear that you're working on that. Thanks. I have a question about manners. Uh, in the discussion, it, it sounded like you were looking at how it was going to be spun out in the future, where what its future organizational home was going to be. And one of the two options was that it might be a su supporting organization a la IETF LLC, and one might be that it's a, a fully independent organization. Um, maybe you could walk us through what the advantages and disadvantages were from the perspective of, of manners and, and what we as the board might end up having to decide about that, if anything? Well, you'll definitely have to decide something um, uh, it, uh, in the event that it is within, the, within our own organization. Um, uh, the, one of the questions really boils down to a question of like how much organization are they going to want? Uh, and because of, the, because of the way that, um, because of the way the, the uh, participants in manners uh, are, are working with one another. It might be that they actually need to, um, uh, that they actually need essentially a lobbying organization, uh, you know, a, 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 an industrial association of some kind. And if that's the case, then um, probably they need to be a standalone organization. We've got to spin them out um, fully and they, they're not part of the internet society. The, the problem is that a lot of the participants like the link to the Internet Society and would like to stay somehow inside the Internet Society. Um, and so they've, they've looked at the IETF model as one that um, you know, seems um, valuable. And so I think the community is still discussing this. I think that's the, um, uh, the real uh, critical thing. Not everybody, uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a total consensus on this, um, and, and there may be uh, some stratification among the among the participants. That is, you know, smaller operations are more keen to be sort of within the internet society, and very large operators uh, are are much more likely to you know to want to join an industry association of some kind um, because they they have you know they have different um, sort of mental models uh, for the for the organizations who are, who are part of it. So I don't. I, I mean, I don't. I don't know what how this is going to sort itself out. It really is something that we're trying to facilitate within the community. So I can't really um, uh, I can't really say which way it's likely to likely to fall. So there's no deadline you've given them to to work this out. Uh, well, I, I mean, 
the idea is that this is supposed to start taking effect next year. So they, you know, kind of got to get it together. I, my understanding is that the um, the conversation is drawing to a close and that they're going to probably be making a, a, a recommendation sometime in September uh, thereabouts. Brian, I saw your hand and then it went down. Are you, did you have That's because you asked the exact question I was going to ask, Ted. Okay, are there other questions for Andrew at this time? John? I need a, my first time using the raise hand tool on this. So since nobody else wants to um, dive in on this one, I guess, I, I wanna go back to the, your existential threat, Andrew, um, because I agree with you um, deeply, actually. <laughs> And um, I guess my question is, what's the plan? Like, if, if, if that's the biggest threat, like, you know, where is there any traction to get on that? Well, uh, it's, it's a good question. The, the reason for the Internet Way of Networking project over the last two years has really been to try to build the, the, the policy framework that we can we can use to, to you know try to try to draw the draw the discussion in a different direction um now we've got to use it now we've got to start um, doing these things and that was the reason for the emphasis in that project on on this impact assessment toolkit because the the observation was that you know for environmental um changes for instance things that people are going to change uh you know when they build a road or a dam or whatever uh, you have to do this assessment. And in a lot of countries, like it's a legally mandated one. Uh, and it's, it's pretty clear to us, at least, that many of the things that people are doing are attempts to, you know, they're, they're, they really involve, this is the handle I got. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start messing with, you know, the, the definition of what an online service is, for instance. And that kind of thing has these consequences. And so what we hope is that by using this tool, we can say to people, look, you haven't done this analysis, and well, you're going to, you know, you're going to pollute the lake. You're going to, um, you're going to destroy this environment. Uh, that's the tool that we've got right now. But I, I say this. To, I think the staff are getting tired of hearing me say it all the time. Like, you know, our the people who are opposed to the internet, who don't want it, who want to tear it down, and so on, are like national governments who can literally print money, and some of the largest and best capitalized corporations in the history of humanity. And we've got less than 50 million bucks and a handful of volunteers. Like that's what our army is, right? Um, and so we're in a perilous situation and we need to make the organization as strong as possible to speak with one voice. That's why you keep hearing this, these attempts to like get us focused on just our stuff because without that focus, we're never, you know, we're just gonna be scattered all over the place. And I think, you know, I believe that we've improved quite a bit in this, in this respect over the past couple of years. Um, but now we really, really got to join that fight, um, you know, all the time, every time it crops up. And it's very difficult to do, given the number of countries there are in the world who are trying to adopt, um, you know, legislation that is really quite harmful to the basic infrastructure of the Internet. A quick follow up. Uh, OK, Ted. Yes, please do. Um, I mean, I, I learned with something I was pretty ignorant of, um, you know, on our onboarding about the limitations of, on lobbying. That are imposed on us because of our IRS status. Do those obligations? I mean, what can we do internationally? Like, is there anything that's like different internationally for lobbying, or is that like totally illegal? Like, I I actually don't know the law about this at all. So it's it's it. The lobbying definition is global. So right. anytime we talk to any government about specific legislation, we have to pay attention to uh, to that. And we've got this tracking um, device. That, um, uh, that we have and I get sign offs and all the rest of it. We made the election we did uh, the year we did it because prior to that we hadn't been taking that, taking that election. Uh, we made the election we did precisely because we could see, oh wow, like we're gonna have to start talking to legislators um, and we're gonna have to do it all the time. And so we've got this limitation. We're working very, very hard to make sure that we, are, we stay entirely within the bounds of our uh, of our legal obligations and so on uh, and that and it is a, it's a cramp it's a cramp on us because we have this additional problem that you know i mean it, it it's one thing 
obviously, you know, there are definitely governments in the world who, who have long been hostile to the internet, and that was never a surprise. And, and, you know, it would be nice to try to do something about that, but the, the reality is we can't. But I, I am, you know, beside myself with worry about the fact that, you know, um, like Canada, the United States, France, Britain, I, I mean, these are countries that historically led the, the development of this infrastructure. And, and now it, it looks to me like unthinkingly probably they are, are going to tear it down because of reasons that I think are valid public policy reasons. But it's, it's really a, a threat to, to this infrastructure. And that's really, um, that's really what, what's worrying about it. Please. Sorry, I had the mic close. The, uh, wh when you speak about all these threats and the, the, the need to act as, uh, in a more monolithic way and with a sense of direction, uh, it's, uh, I, I agree very much with that. But the, uh, I'm getting worried about the, this community consultation when you see that the priority uh, for the individual members is to expand rather than protect or defend. Yes, so uh, I don't know, I, I, and I think there is not a, a simple answer, but I, I think we should develop some strategy to enforce this um, uh, counteract, defend uh, strategies amongst the individuals and uh, to reinforce what the organi organization members uh, were uh, setting as a priority, which is, uh, I, if I don't remember well, was protect, right? So uh, I, I do think it, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, the, the materials for the internet way of networking are not, it, it's not a sort of simple thing that you can grab hold of very easily. Uh, it's it's really a sort of conceptual one, and we've got a lot of work to do in order to make this clear to people and get people to understand, you know, what the advantage is. The other thing about it, of course, and and this is another issue that we we face. We're the Internet Society, so basically every one of our members thinks that the internet is great and uh, and can't understand why anybody would like you know not want it and so on. And so we don't have the we don't have the the population within ourselves that sort of naturally says, oh yes, this is, this is under, uh, under real threat, unless you're facing these things all the time. And so I think that there's a whole lot of people for, uh, who have joined who are really looking at, at us to you know, sort of try, to try to expand access and make sure that people have access to the internet and make sure that they have access to the, to the tools and, and uh, um, training that we, we provide and so on. Uh, but for the internet, I mean, if we're an advocacy organization for the internet, our problem is that we need everybody to understand the value of this thing. And I think, I think that's something that we've still got to do some more work on, uh, on those materials, but I think we've got a solid foundation. I think that that's the, that's the good news about it. I, I, I believe that that project went a long way to make it very, very clear and, 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 to, um, and to provide the necessary um, uh, materials for people to be able to do the, the advocacy that we hope they will. So, so I have three people in queue right, right now, myself, Robert, and then Mohammed. Uh, I'll make my own quick. Uh, the two things are, one, my experience with governments is that it is far, far more uh, effective dealing with them, not just telling them they shouldn't do X, if you can say do Y instead, because they want to do something. And if you just say don't do X, the resistance to, to that message is just extraordinarily high. Uh, not nearly as high if you can say, do why it's the right way instead. Uh, the second uh, point is uh, the internet way of networking as a, as a set of documents and as a set of approaches, I think is, is compelling as, as you say, as a foundation and advocating for that foundation is good, but it's not yet a call to action. And I think you, you saw from my exchange with Joyce on, on her presentations, I, I strongly believe that if we are going to get uh, the, the society as a whole, as opposed to the staff to act on this, you need a compelling call to action. And formulating that, I would suggest, is top of, top of the list of things for, for what you and your senior staff need to be doing, both to bring um, 
members in, in general, and uh, in particular to focus them on this issue, because that call to action can move us beyond the, the lobbying activities to which we are permitted to the kinds of activities which the other parts of the society as organizations, as individuals, as chapters can and will do. Um, because they are independent actors, their limits are not the same. Uh, so I, I strongly encourage you to consider how to create a call to action. Um, and Robert, you're next. Thank you. So, um, uh, Andrew, I completely agree with your, um, uh, you know, urgency, you know that, I mean, we've worked together on these issues. I also would agree, Ted, that, um, you know, we've, we're many years beyond just saying no, we have to find alternatives. Uh, but part of that, I think, is something that we're already uh, beginning to do. And, and uh, Andrew, you, you uh, alluded to it. And that, frankly, is we're, you know, through the you know, gathering of the data uh, about the internet. Um, but I think we can go beyond that in terms of how people are using it, how they're benefiting, um, uh, but also understanding why there are people who are not online or are not benefiting as much. I think does become part of the compelling arguments uh, in crafting um, the alternatives. Um, there are um, many times that governments are, are jumping in um, with solutions, but they have not art clearly articulated the problem that they're trying to solve for. And that's always the first question I think we need to be asking. You know, what's the problem you're solving for? Uh, and then are there ways that we, as the Internet Society building a community, can help solve, help them solve those problems? Um, because oftentimes the solutions that we're seeing that, you know, we understand are counterproductive actually are not related to the problems they're trying to solve. Finally, um, in terms of governments, I think it's a little oversimplified, but it works, right? It's a two by two. There are governments that are well-intentioned and those that are not. There are governments that are well-informed and then there are those that are not. Many times what we see are well-intentioned governments that are not well-informed of uh, proposing or taking actions that have adverse consequences, even contrary to what they're trying to achieve. Um, so part of what we're doing and what we can do as the Internet Society, and we're doing more of it, is through the is is helping governments become better informed to understand. Um, we're seeing, and there's there's a unfortunately a persistence, and I would argue a growing number of governments that are ill-intentioned, and some of those are extremely well informed, and those are the most difficult to combat. Um, and then you have those that are ill-informed and ill-intentioned, and that's just more difficult to deal with. Um, and you can, each of you, you know, mentally go through that two by two and think about the kinds of responses that we're seeing from different governments for different purposes. Um, just one example, without naming the, the, the country, there was a, a country that began to impose um, taxes on the internet. Um, and, and on internet usage. And one of the arguments, and, and by the way, a number of us predicted, well, that's going to reduce, people are going to drop off the internet, right? Thinking that that was a bad thing. Um, and one of the responses from one of the government officials was, that's the point, right? Because they don't, some governments don't want people on, online. So that's a, that, that would be what I would uh, think of or put into the quadrant of um, ill-intentioned, in, Ill well-informed. Um, and I think so, it's, so uh, Andrew, to your point and to the agenda is I think if we have to be more strategic in thinking about how to respond, but also, you know, look, the vast, vast majority of governments and, and, and the billions of people want to be online. They see the benefits of the internet. And I think we can really help um, you know, in, improve the, the information, the capacity, but also the compelling arguments on why it's important to be connected.
Mohammed, you may still be on mute. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. This is uh, really uh, was enlightening uh, presentation that we uh, viewed a couple of days back, and an inter interesting discussion as well. One thing that I uh, just wanted to highlight here, and perhaps if not immediately uh, in the near term or in the longer term plans, you can think of is that internet uh, connectivity and the, the tagline of ISOC, internet is for everyone. Uh, when we interpret this line should mean that meaningful connectivity. A person who, uh, and I have seen people who just uh, watch videos on Facebook or YouTube is also connected to the internet. And also a person who connects to the internet, goes online, does some business, uh, sends some money abroad or within the country, it's also a connectivity. But it's, it, uh, you may agree with me that this is a next level of the connectivity. Uh, while we can uh, discuss the benefits of both and the, and the both users, the prior, their priorities, uh, we would also agree that everyone has the right to connect meaningfully to the internet. Uh, I have seen people, uh, particularly people with disabilities, uh, refusing services or not using the services of certain banks and financial institutions just because the, the service was not accessible. Uh, when I say accessible, I mean uh, that the, there were certain hitches where uh, it would require uh, some other assistance, some outside assistance uh, for them to use that service. So, so this, I, I mean to say that when, when you uh, prepare uh, your next set of communications, you can include that it's not just the connectivity. And this is uh, the way that uh, internet society uh, is uh, defending the internet, because if everyone is using internet meaningfully, it becomes more important for them to defend and also the stakes are included uh, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Andrew, that's a lot to chew on. Do you want to chew on it a little bit or answer now? Uh, well, so, I mean, we are part of the, um, I am a commissioner in the broadband um, forum in the UN and that forum is um, uh, very strong on this uh, on this line of meaningful connectivity. Um, but from from the Internet Society's point of view, uh, what is meaningful connectivity is dependent on you. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that the Internet Society has a, a, a view about what people ought to do with their with their connections. The nice thing about the Internet is that it's this general purpose um, uh, you know, uh, technology, which means that you can do what you want with it. And that fact that you can do what you want with it is, is part of the, part of the advantage that we see. So I think that that part, that, that piece of our emphasis in, um, in the internet way of networking project uh, about how this is an, uh, you know, a, a general purpose technology that can be used for all kinds of different things is a core part of what the internet society is, is after in, in trying to promote the internet. But I completely agree with you that the more people rely on the internet, the more important it becomes to them. Um, and I think that what's interesting is, is that this current drift in public policy is chipping away at that general purpose uh, and, and instead making it really a, you know, a transport mechanism for a few very large um, corporations. And um, that is a that is a really dangerous um, uh, drift, and and that's that's why I get so concerned about it. Thank you. Uh, we do have Renelia's uh, report up next as part of this general uh, discussion, yeah. so I suggest we move to to that now, and then if there's time at the end, we can return to. Uh, more general discussion. I'm sure an existential question for the society and for the internet as a whole uh, will occupy us for more than the allotted time. Uh, so why don't we move uh, to, to the practical matters uh, of the budget and membership that Renalia shared with us. Renalia? 
Thank you, Ted. I hope that I've provided a clear enough overview of our planning process for the organization that essentially helps us develop the annual action plan as well as budget. So I'm happy to address any questions that you may have about that. Well, so first I'd like to thank you for uh, addressing the questions that, that I had for you uh, in advance. That, that was very helpful. There was one tiny follow-up um, I wanted to, to do. You, you, you listed some of the, um, the members who were already involved in the encryption project. And I, I wondered if you, if you had a target number of members you wanted involved in that or a percentage of members who you expected to be involved in that and, and how that process was gonna go would be a, just an addition, a little tiny bit of additional data if you have it. So I, we don't have targets for organizational members. What I've been doing um, in terms of the success measures related to project leaders and what they're supposed to deliver is to encourage them and the project teams to integrate the ISOC community as much as possible across the board. So the org members, the chapter um, members, as well as the individual members. It is a work in progress but I would like to share with you a little bit of data um, on where we stand at the end of last year in terms of participation in projects. It's in the chat right now. So you would recall in my response to your email that I had said, okay, the survey response this year is low, but last year was worse. Um, so while last year was worse, by the end of the year, we actually got pretty good involvement across our community. For example, 59% of org members got involved in projects and the bulk of them are of course in manners, but still there are others who are involved across the other projects. Um, also 49% 49 of, 49 of chapters in good standing also got involved in projects. 1,871 individual members ended up did something related to projects primarily because we've had the training called the fundamentals that informed our community members about what the projects are about, what are the issues that they're trying to tackle. And um, this is part of the training where 77% of chapters participated in it, and then more than 500 people who participated in the training actually implemented something post-training that support the projects themselves. So that's not bad. And I also wanted to share you where we are at mid-year um, along the same lines. And here we are, even though we have the survey response, this is not bad for mid-year. In terms of org members, we are at 40%, chapters at 37%. I expect these numbers to be higher by the end of the year. And then the indirect support or involvement is that chapters doing activities on their own, just after learning what the projects are about, then they're doing it in the areas that the projects are activating. And also we've, we have more than 3000 individual members that are engaged. Um, so that, that's the additional data point that I want to give. So the the uh, short answer to your question is I don't have a target, um, but we will know by the end of the year in terms of how high they can go. I really appreciate the additional data. Thank you. Louise? Yes, that's me, right, Ted? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, Rinalia. Thank you very much for your presentation. I sent you some uh, points and questions in, uh, through the email. The, uh, the, the only thing that worries me is about the statistical certainty of the results, because the, the, the sample is so small that we can doubt about the, uh, the, 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 the results. But making the calculations, then uh, there is not that big error because we're talking about plus minus 4%. Yes, theoretical. So, but the, um, the, the, do we have any plan to improve this response rate? Uh, the, uh, I know that only about 65% of the individual members get uh, the communications because of the mail out option and the, um, but, do, you, do we have any plan to improve the response rate to get more accurate uh, responses? Or we should think about other ways such as uh, focus groups or mainly, uh, maybe something more controllable. Mm -hmm. So last year when we did our survey, we didn't just do the survey, we also had dedicated calls just to get more feedback qualitatively by discussing it with community members. 
This year, we didn't do it because we have a follow-up uh, process as part of the action plan process that I had presented, which is um, different parts of the organization would go back to the community to get them more involved based on areas uh, that they are interested in. But I also want you to get a, a bigger context on survey responses for ISOC. Last year, we had several consultations and I noted a pattern. When our community members are interested enough in the topic, they will respond. For example, there was a consultation on learning needs last year and the response rate was almost 3000 respondents across our community. Second example, the consultation on the new fellowship program. We had slightly over a thousand respondents. A third example is the consultation on strategic goals, which is the definition of what is open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy internet, which can be a little bit controversial because there is a diversity of opinions in, in our community, but the response rate was also slightly over a thousand. So when it comes to the action plan priorities and what it focus on itself, two years now we've done the consultation and the response rate is low. So my sort of uh, just hunch about it is that they are either not too interested in it at that level, but some of them who are interested will engage directly in the projects and activities themselves, and they find other ways to do what they are interested in. Certainly we can take measures to improve by adding the focus um, groups itself and building in the confidence points in the, in the survey results, if you prefer it that way. But my sense is it will not be a huge um, improvement. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Pepper? Um, so, Renalia, this is very helpful. And to, to your last point, um, uh, I think it is difficult to increase the numbers. But what I wanted to ask was, um, and I don't know of a way to do it, but my intuition is that if we benchmarked it against other similar organizations, right, that are doing sort of actually a lot of good work, that the relative number of respondents would not be all that different. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is something that is um, necessary. We, we always can try to do better and we need to do better, but I wouldn't beat up on ourselves necessarily. Um, and I, I'm just wondering whether there's a way to benchmark against other similar organizations, you know, maybe in other areas. Um, and that may be something that you want to do or the staff wants to do because I suspect it's not going to be very much different um, in other sectors or other parallel types of organizations. Thank you, Pepper. I'll, I will look into that and see. And if board members have ideas on what those organizations might be, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this point? Any other uh, questions or comments for Renalia's report? Uh, I'll have one final question. You said everybody is looking forward to um, the, the replacement of member Nova. I, I join <laughs> you. I am also looking forward to the replacement of member Nova. Do we have a theory on when, when will this happy day will occur? It is part of the plan for this year. It is under Sandy's area of responsibility, and I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will get it done. <laughs> Thank you, Renalia. It's, and, it's and, in the process now. <laughs> we're, we're working on it. <laughs> and happily, uh, we'll, we'll be moving on to uh, Sandy's report next, so she can fill us in on that along with everything else. Uh, thank you very much, Renalia. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are running a little bit ahead, but I think probably best to just go ahead and power through unless anybody feels a strong need to take a quick break now. No, okay, uh, let's go on to Sandy's report then. Sandy? Um, this is a closed session, Ted, so um, we should probably move to the, the other Zoom room. Thank you very much for reminding me. Uh, so uh, thank you to our observers and to those who've been watching because this report is financial in nature, it will be in executive session. Thanks again.